Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul is talking with the CEO of Organifi, May Stiegler. May grew up in Northern California, learning many of her life lessons in her parents' organic garden. She believes health and vitality, the ability to nourish our bodies, minds, and spirit, begins with our simplest daily choices. Because of this, May enjoys designing rituals from routines, finding wonder and presence in nature, and doing challenging, meaningful work. Now serving as Organifi's CEO and a member of the founding team, May brings over 15 years of experience in the agricultural and health industries. Since being founded in 2014, she has played a key role in Organifi, making Inc.'s 5,000 fastest growing companies list and being awarded Forbes's Great Places to Work more than four years in a row. If you enjoy today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind, and to live their dreams. We hope you enjoy the conversation between Paul and one of our podcast sponsors, May Stiegler of Organifi, as they discuss real food, real fast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, our title is Real Food, Real Fast. My guest is the CEO of Organifi, May Steigler. I think you're going to be amazed with May. She's a beautiful, intelligent woman, and she's got a lot to share with us. So I'm super excited. May, welcome to Living 4D with me. Paul, it's a treat to be here. Thank you so much for sharing the space. Ah, oh, lovely. Love to love to share. I love intelligent women. So uh, I'm I'm right at home with you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, May with your uh, position as CEO uh, CEO of Organifi, which has been named uh, as one of Inc.'s 500 fastest growing companies four times, which is quite <laughs> impressive, and awarded the Forbes Great Place to Work for three years. That's got to be very rewarding for you, and. Um, I'd love the audience to get a chance to know more about you, how you developed your passion for business, and why leading the Organifi team is important to you. And after all, a woman with your skills probably has a lot of options to make a living. So you've chosen to be with Organifi, and uh, you're the CEO. So I'm just excited to know how did you grow yourself? What made you you? And how did you end up deciding to be the CEO of Organifi when there's probably many different things you could do? <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul. Um, that was a compliment for sure. So I appreciate that. Uh, and it certainly is unconventional. I didn't set out you know, 10 years ago when I first met Drew, uh, the founder of Organifi, thinking that I wanted to be the CEO by any measure. My, um, my nature is one of coaching and developing people, developing teams, developing culture and uh, for impact. And so uh, very kind of organically led to this seat over the last 10 years working uh, with Drew, the founder, and and with this team, really. So it's been a huge honor. And, you know, the the accomplishments you shared are are, are still something that is is really um, something I'm kind of blown away by. It's not something that I have come to expect and instead something that's just been part of um, the incredible team that we've built and uh, I've been grateful to be part of. And, and Really, my origin story. Ten years ago, um, meeting Drew, I was a personal trainer at the time, and was really wanting to uh, find a way of higher impact with more people. I was working one on one in in a gym setting, and I was really sure that there was a bigger conversation to be had uh, instead of just guiding reps and exercise. There was so much more that had to do with uh, health. Yes, that I uh, was more like lifestyle, more more nutrition focused, quite quite clearly, and. And it led me to work with Drew and, and over the, the years developed this, this team and this uh, company, Organifi. And, um, and it's been quite a, an adventure. I grew up in our, an organic garden, uh, 40 acres in Northern California, my, my parents still own. And I couldn't have quite understood the importance of that origin story that I get to live out today, kind of this family legacy of, of the importance of connection with real food. Your parents must be excited about what you're doing. They are. They are. They they get the luxury of eating food from the garden, though, um, and they very much appreciate the the supplements and the products that Organifi makes. Have a lot of respect for for what I've been able to create here with the team. Um, so certainly feel feel a lot of uh, support and and pride for both my parents and my family in general, which is a huge gift. 
Yeah, especially in today when families are so broken from all the craziness in the world, it's a blessing to have a coherent family structure. Um, it really disables people if they don't have that, as I'm sure you're well aware. It's yeah, it's foundational, and and there was a uh, after college, I, I, I a time that I want to actually speak to in that where I really disagreed with my parents' philosophy on food, and uh, in so many ways, my journey has been a returning to home, returning to to seeing the wisdom of my parents and and a lot of my ancestors, essentially, and our ancestors in general. But I um I went to school for animal nutrition and was pre vet. I studied um, research and development in animal nutrition, and I actually worked in big ag post college. So. I got to learn uh, as many lessons. Actually, our team was reflecting on this last week. Most of our lessons, if not all of them, are, are learned the hard way. Otherwise, I think it's hard to learn. <laughs> so right. so I, uh, one of my, my harder learned lessons was uh, working at, at farm level. I was working uh, at uh, very large scale dairies and I was actually uh, on a great mission. We were, we were looking to reduce the, the use of antibiotics in our food system. And so we were using temperature monitoring boluses. This was now almost 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And, uh, and we were using these temperature monitors to detect illness early and reduce the use of antibiotics and mastitis, pneumonia, um, even being able to detect, of course, estrus and heat earlier in dairy cattle and just manage a herd more effectively. Uh, and it was such a stark <laughs> learning in how our food system, um, is so, uh, underserving our actual human needs. I, I got to see firsthand where, animals were being fed a diet that wasn't serving them. High corn, for instance, on in this instance, uh, high energy diet that also created high instance of mastitis and pneumonia and disease. And witnessing this and just recognizing how un, uh, unfortunately cared for these animals were not cared for, they had to use high, you know, high amounts of antibiotics to just take care of the animals as we were feeding them, mainly because we were feeding them the wrong things. And, and so it was just such a a learning lesson, uh, the quality of the the feed that these cows were eating. And then also this was the base of our food system. And so I shifted directions at that, at that point. I really wanted to focus on human nutrition, recognizing that the change point was really the perception that people, you know, our, our society was asking for this, this food system. They wanted, you know, cheap dairy products and, uh, they, you know, weren't necessarily valuing, um, the, the proper care for these animals and food systems. So I shifted focus from animal health, being deep in that kind of R&D industry, and went to human nutrition and became a personal trainer and nutritionist. And that was, again, that origin story of where I met Drew and how he was working with people and their health. And um, it all started there. So that moment where I was in big ag and thinking that GMOs were actually the future, <laughs> can you believe yeah. it or not? Well, I was you know, <laughs> sometimes uh, the light strikes when you least expect it. Yeah, but and maintaining that relationship with my parents. I remember so many when I'd go visit home because I lived in Colorado at the time. Uh, my parents live in Northern California, and I'd be home visiting, and our dinner conversations were pretty heated. You know, I had very different beliefs than my my parents at the time. They were still growing or, organic food and believing in it, and the, the value of that, how they raised my sister and I. And so that lesson, I really had to learn myself and see firsthand when um, just the quality of food and, and the, the food we give our animals is a reflection of also um, our own bodies and our own food system. So yeah, it was a beautiful returning to appreciating the, the intention and education my parents offered um, since I was born really. And um, now I have immense joy getting back home and getting to benefit from, you know, the food from, from the garden that, that um, you know, fills our table. Yeah. Yeah. Um well, you said you learned some pretty tough lessons, but I must say the animals learned the tougher lesson because they were the ones that were the subjects and they still are, as you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, it was, you know, kind of my pursuit was addressing animal health from the farm level. And I really realized that it actually starts with consumer education. You know, if, if there's a demand for that format of cheap food, it's going to keep being produced. And you're right, the the animal welfare issues that were, you know, really being made present. There's lots of research on CAFOs at the time coming out. Even when I was in college, I went to Cal Poly and it's a huge ag college. So it's a lot of, um, my papers were focused on that and uh, just really seeing the repercussions of that type, t style of food, food system being uh, dysfunctional. And goodness, the animals certainly uh, suffer the largest consequence of that. Well, you know, I'd like to make an offer. If you'll send me 
your parents' address, I will sign a copy of my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy to them, so they can see that there's at least one guy floating around in the world that says, congratulations, mom and dad, you did a good job. <laughs> Paul, that would, that would be so cool. I will absolutely follow up with that. And they, they would actually really love the book too. I, if they haven't, if I haven't already gifted it to them, we were just talking before this call, uh, I may have gifted it to them, but a signed copy from you would be really incredible. So I will do that. I love it. I'd like to do it just to say thank you for grounding May so beautifully and giving her the wisdom that ultimately brought her home. Thank you, Paul. Let, let's do it. It'll blow their minds. <laughs> well, what's cool is, you know, you're the CEO of Organifi, which is a, you know, a very successful company that reaches potentially millions of people with their products. And your parents have to be aware that they are contributors to that. Thank you. I, I try to remind them and give them a lot of credit as much as I can. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. There, there's a little family legacy there too, in in that they were heavily involved in um in the early 70s and the even the logo creation of the um the uh, CCOF. So they were they were involved in Slide Ranch, the kind of Marin food movement. Uh they both lived on the ranch and and had um they actually supported inner city kids getting reconnected to food. And so they'd bring groups of kids out for a weekend or an overnight. Um, And so part of kind of my family legacy is what I get to do in a different way, but I I still like to really keep that connection and and remind my parents of what a good, good role model they were. And I promise it's not just making up for the time that I was in big ag. (laughs) I tell (laughs) them, I promise. Yeah, that's great. But um, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I have a lot of respect for, um, they're both horticulturalists and biologists and and um, set a really good foundation for just supporting the reconnecting with our food system. And, and I think so much of what is relevant and needed today is much, much more of that. So they were ahead of their time in a lot of ways. I appreciate that. Well, you're, you're, you're bringing up something very important for me as a father of three kids with a grandson. And that is, you know, how we parent our children really has a massive impact on what they bring to the world, you know, and I think, right. I think you're a very good example. And, and, you know, it's important for children to go out into the world and test mom and dad's ideas to challenge them because otherwise, <laughs> <I> certainly did. <laughs> well, you see, the thing is, is if you don't do that, then you can't authentically embrace what mom and dad gave you and make it your own because you know how important it is as opposed to just doing what mom and dad said, which means you, you just remain mommy and daddy's child in an adult body. So that's what puberty is. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to go out in the world. And, you know, I say, if your mom and dad were really good at managing money, that's not something you want to go through puberty and reject. <laughs> you know, if your mom and dad are really good at farming and feeding you, if you go through puberty and reject that, I'll know who you are because you'll be covered in pimples and you'll feel like crap all the time and you'll finally have to come back to mom and dad and say, well, I guess you were right. You know, so the point I'm making for all the listeners is how you feed your children and how you parent your children ultimately is probably the greatest impact on the future of this planet that there can be. And I'm just grateful that your parents did such a good job with you. And I was raised on a farm and a, a big one, 142 acres. Wow. And we raised uh, sheep. We had a woolen factory. We had cows. We milked our own cows, made our own cheese, um, made our own, uh, you know, butter from the cow's milk, uh, buttermilk. We um, had produce. We had horses. We had uh, chickens. We uh, got our own eggs. I think we probably had about 50 chickens. Um, we had pigs at, uh, when I was a kid in Idaho, we had we had a pig farm. We had about a hundred and something pigs. And then my parents immigrated to Canada. So but we had a full working farm. So I I mean I was raised on a full working farm. And my father wasn't an organic farmer. He's what's classified as a mixed farmer. He has a degree in agriculture, but he felt that there were certain things that science had justified that he felt he could mix with the concepts of organic farming. Now, looking back today with my knowledge and having having studied soil science uh, extensively, I would challenge him, and I have challenged him on it. And my father actually was the president of the Farming Association uh, where I grew up for a number of years as well. But the point being is I grew up 
living off of our own land. Hardly, my parents didn't have to buy much from the stores. They did sometimes, but majority of what we ate came right off the land. And so as I grew up and I got out into the world of athletics and started reading books on, you know, the top nutrition. And I noticed I, I was getting gassy. I was bloating up. I was tired. My brain wasn't clear. And so I finally started going back to just eating the way I ate on the farm. And lo and behold, I tightened right up. My head cleared up and I felt great. And I'm like, why, why, why am I even bothering with all this so-called scientific stuff? Because it's not scientific at all. And as a therapist, I would run into this over and over and over again. I was like forever having to teach people the basics of how to eat. And I was actually just having a conversation um, with the girl that does our media, who's actually the, was the champion, I think, for a couple of years on television. And she's the champion ninja warrior. She's a very amazing athlete. And we were talking about this kind of stuff. And th the conversation we were having is is how the grand majority of the supplements out there don't really do much because they're such low quality. And I use a very comprehensive system called a health appraisal questionnaire, which looks at 29 different organ, gland, and body systems. And so based on the symptoms a person is having, for example, there's classic symptoms. Whenever someone's got a liver disease, there's characteristic symptoms that will emerge. If someone's got a kidney problem, there's characteristic symptoms that emerge. So a well-designed health appraisal questionnaire is a collection of the questions that are the most common indicators that doctors have found ultimately were proven to be connected to some kind of a disease or dysfunction because then they got the diagnosis and said, okay, well, this person had these complaints. And then they start saying, well, look, here's 25 or 50 or 100 people that had this liver disease, and here's the complaints they had. So a real well done health appraisal questionnaire has all the common indicators of pathology or dysfunction or imbalance in that gland organ or system. So using this as a screening tool to tell me where to look, I was using a, a very well thought out system. I won't mention the company's name, but um, it's a very well known nutrition company. And for each of the high scores, they would tell you which of their products that you would use to lower the score. I was tracking this for multiple years with patients and their scores wouldn't come down. And I'm like, you know, I, I actually was a therapist for the owner of the company and his son and his daughter. And what happened is in, in that period, I found Bill Walcott's work and his book, The Metabolic Typing Diet. Yes. And so I started running the metabolic typing questionnaires on everybody and identifying where their starting point should be to start balancing the ratio of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. And then I switched everybody to organic food that I could get to go to organic food. And within two weeks, I, I noticed actually within about the first week, soft tissues changed, muscle injuries were healing faster, inflammation was leaving, joints weren't hurting. And so what happened is by the time I had this meeting with the owner of this company, I just put, the, I put a whole bunch of health appraisal questionnaires and say, look, I'm using your own system. Here's 20 or 30 patients or four. I mean, I had file drawers full of them. Wow. And these are the ones I was using your supplements on. And I said, now, here's what happened when I stopped using those supplements and I put them on organic food and I did metabolic typing on them and look at these scores dropping down. I could, I could get more changes in two weeks than I did in a year without these changes. So why that's important is because what I found, and, and we can talk more about this, is that we've developed a mentality where people use the medical allopathic model of this symptom, that drug. Now it becomes this symptom, that nutrient, or this symptom, that vitamin. But the problem is most of those vitamins and, and, and things that are people are taking are not coming from organic sources. So what you've got is concentrated, poisoned, commercially raised garbage in capsules that is now dehydrated, dried out with emulsifiers, stabilizers, colorings, and whatever else they're throwing in there. And so for me, I learned through a lot of experimentation and research that there is no substitute for a wholesome diet, and there's no substitute 
for not eating organic because if you're not eating organic, you're eating nutritionally deficient, toxic foods. And I don't care what pill capsule it is or how pretty the bottle is or what famous athlete is marketing it. I've seen it all. And, you know, I've worked with a long, long, long list of the best athletes in the world and the best sports teams and Olympic committees and militaries. So I've seen this problem reoccur, reoccur, just like clockwork over and over again, which will, would lead me to a comment. And, and I won't work with anyone, especially as a podcast sponsor that doesn't make products that I don't know work in me, for me, and for my family. And I've known Drew for a long time. I mean, my God, how long has it been? I mean, I can't even remember. My son's 43. And when he was about 17, he was working in a gym in La Jolla that Drew worked in. Yes, yes. So I used to see Drew in the gym and we would chat. And then I remember when Drew started getting into film work and things like that. So uh, let's see, 17, he's 43 now. So I don't know what, what would that be? It's, it's 20, 25 years or something. 25 years. Yeah. And, and I don't have children yet, but to just agree full heartedly that there is no supplement or replacement for whole organic food. My hope is that when, and if my husband and I have kids that we find a way to connect with food in the same way that you and I were raised, I think it's unfortunately so unique these days yeah. to be that connected. And, and it teaches so many important lessons of the power of whole food. And I think, you know, to, to, to zoom into this current day, in many ways, I'm, I'm kind of a, an unconventional CEO of a supplement company because I hardly believe in supplements in the space. <laughs> that, and, and, I, and, I, and I think like it, in the space that, and, and I, it's kind of fun to start the conversation that way, is like, I don't believe in supplementation if the fundamentals of your nutrition are not the focus and why Organifi takes so much time to formulate and our recipes have whole food in them. So if, if you don't have those sources, to your point, we're we're just we're just spot uh, addressing problems that could be holistically solved by yeah. simply high quality food. And it's such an important conversation today. You know, you see um, you see so, so many folks trying to address problems at the tip of the pyramid, and they're missing the whole foundational level. Yes, I call it band aid patch technologies, and it, it's so classic. You know, I was just talking with Kirsty, like I was mentioning. I said, "Isn't it amazing? We went from eating real food to say taking supplements to try to trick the system to biohacking, <laughs> which is now just an electronic version of the same silly story." And I don't see any evidence that people that are using the supplements or the biohacking are improving at all. In fact, because they're all trying to get to some magic place, be it athletic performance or sleep better or sex Focus. better, by tricking the system and there's no way you can escape sound sleep sound movement healthy breathing good nutrition and using your mind appropriately and having a relationship with your body and i just like i watch this and i go how long is this going to go on before people finally wake up to the fact that as you would say you, you can't build a pyramid without a foundation on it you know yeah it's, it's fundamental um and I think it's human nature to to look for shortcuts in many ways, you know, and if you're missing, as you're talking about those just keystones to living a healthy life, the supplements don't help, you know. Um, no, yeah. It's interesting, you know, we're living in an era where there's more assaults on our immune system, let's say, there's more toxins in the environment. Um, and so there's this other perspective that I like to just bring into the conversation where let's say superfoods or adaptogens or key support to our healthy living is more important yes. than ever. So I don't want to, mm. you know, I don't want to downgrade that because that's really where I see how whole food and great, you know, lifestyle and nutrition pair nicely with supplementation, but, but it's, it's not um, devoid of each other, right? It's not, um, it's not simply supplementation. It's got to be this combination of the two and the way in which we get there to your point, the assessment, which you brought up was, I believe it was in your first book, when I used with, clients when I was a personal trainer. So that comprehensive really? assessment that was just asking the right questions. And I, yeah. I, I, I wasn't uh, offering the supplements at the time at all that you mentioned. I think that's probably before the, the book, but it's so critical to have this assessment of where is our status of health today to know what we should address and how. Yes. And, and to reiterate and, and expand on the point you just made, one of the problems we have is that if a person, let's say they buy organic food, they might go to a Jimbo's or to a kind of a standard place. 
Um, Whole Foods used to be okay, but now they've destroyed everything with all their garbage. It's not what it was. No, it's just a, it's just a, uh, it's a, it's an empty signifier. It's, it's sad, but it's so common as you know. And, And that's, by the way, that's one of the things I love about Organifi is because even though they've gotten bigger and bigger, they haven't done what most corporations do. They go cheaper and cheaper. So you know, true. it's so like true. the more successful Hershey's got, the smaller the chocolate bars got. <laughs> the more <laughs> successful Chevron oil got, the smaller the quarts of oil got. <laughs> the more successful Chevrolet got, the lo- the shorter the time their engines lasted. I'm like, you know, but what you know what I love is is that Drew is so passionate and he really wants to do a good job. And, and, and you, if you haven't had the conversation with Drew of all the work I put him through to sponsor <laughs> the podcast, I said, I need to see all your organic certification. I need to know this is real. I'm not going to do this on a word, even though you're my friend, I have got to be honest with people and make sure. So he sent me 14 of them. I'm like, well, holy shit, he's for real. <laughs> he's not playing around. No, we, we have them on all of our products. And it's, I mean, Paul, I, I take the products every day. My family does, right? The, the mm-hmm. two parents that live on this organic farm, right? They're, they're very discerning in their health. And my sister and her nine-month-old baby, right? Obviously not taking them yet, but her and her husband take, they take the products. So it's so important that um, we do continue to stand behind those quality standards. And it's so much our origin story. You know, we come from 10 years ago juicing. So we were literally making these recipes at the time. We were driving to Whole Foods. We were filming videos. We were buying all organic produce and we were educating, you know, similar to you, educating on the importance of, especially when you're looking to improve your health, focusing on, we were using the clean 15 and the dirty dozen. If, you know, you couldn't afford all organic, just really focusing on the high impact vegetables and fruits that, you know, are are most sprayed, avoiding those and ensuring that you're buying organic or local. But especially if you're infusing your body like with juicing, it's high concentrations of those vegetables. So even more important to buy organic. And so from this origin story, and I think something quite unique about Organifi is we had made the actual recipes by hand ourselves many times Mm -hmm. (laughs) and and we made them with organic ingredients. So it was a no-brainer to start our product lines with organic certified ingredients because we didn't know... we, we. couldn't have imagined anything different. And that was kind of the starting place of our, just our baseline certifications that we would come to expect as just, if we can't certify something organic, we're not going to make it. And today that's even become glyphosate residue free. So we just keep raising the bar because from there, and it, you know, also was reflected in like the principles I grew up with, with treating the soil well. You talked about, you know, understanding soil science. And if we're not, if we're not investing in practices and agriculture that at least has our future in mind, let alone actually supporting it, we're ultimately destroying our planet and our food system with every single purchase. And so minimally, we wanted to be a business that could act as a positive vote for the future of our planet, of course, for our bodies with, by putting mm-hmm. this food in there. And the kids, a lot of your products are, my kids love, you know, yes. they, uh, there's nothing that I have given them from Organifi they don't love. But I think one of the most popular ones is it's, it's, it's the chocolate version of Organifi gold. gold. Yeah. It's so good. And, you know, I, I used to say to Penny and Angie, are you sure you want to give them chocolate before bed? I said, that <laughs> might wind them up. And they say, oh, no, they actually like this. And it doesn't wind them up. I'm like, okay, well, trust Drew to figure out how to make chocolate not wind you up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have we have kind of three, three filters with our products. Um, and the last one being, it's got to taste incredible. And we're going to, you know, we worked with basically an incredible um, kind of restauranteur, an amazing chef uh, to create our initial formulations. And that's been our benchmark ever since. So they have to be craveable, you know, healthy can be delicious. We believe in that disruptive mentality. Unfortunately, that's not normal normal and in, in, in our thinking about healthy, but it's certainly possible. And you growing up on, on a farm, like you know how good fresh food should and could taste. So we wanted to make those products that great. And it had to be part of creating a habit, creating a, a lifestyle that you're looking forward to. So every product, every formulation is is designed with that as kind of that that final check mark in the formulation. Mm-hmm. The top two, which are, are key, first one being that it's formulated with a, a clinically proven ingredient. So we're not just throwing a bunch of garbage in there and marketing some benefit that's not actually tested and validated by actual humans seeing the benefit of this. And yes. And the, the second part is is really bringing together a synergistic group of additional whole food ingredients that support that benefit. So it's, you know, we kind of believe that one plus one is three. It's almost like a <laughs> gestalt form of a, a formulation. But those three 
formulation steps are key in all of our products. And that's why we don't produce, you know, 50 products a year. Uh, it takes us a long time right now. And I'm, I'm grateful for that process. And I mean, comparing it to growing real food, I have a lot of patience for good quality food. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everybody. For the month of April, the Czech Institute is offering a special discount offer on all integrated movement science level one prerequisite courses. I designed the Integrated Movement Science Level 1 specifically to address what was missing in the personal trainer and strength coaching certifications worldwide. Why? Because the percentage of people at all ages engaging exercise professionals commonly show up with a variety of postural and muscle imbalance syndromes, unresolved and undiagnosed orthopedic injuries, and chronic health challenges such as global inflammation or metabolic syndrome, chronic fatigue, adrenal exhaustion, digestive and eliminative challenges, high levels of toxicity from the environment and from eating non-organic foods that come in plastics cans and from cooking with toxic cookware, such as aluminum and cookware with Teflon linings. Teflon is used to stop foods from sticking to pans, but the problem is it sticks to you. A good example of why integrated movement science level one is so important for anyone that wants to master effective exercise program design for themselves or for any exercise or healthcare professional that designs corrective, general conditioning, or high performance conditioning programs was demonstrated in a study that I read in a major medical journal about 10 years ago. The study was conducted by finding a large group of adults that had never had any back pain. The subjects were then given an MRI scan for the lumbar spine. The researchers found that 72% of the pain-free subjects had a lumbar disc bulge. When the MRI scans were put before a panel of orthopedic surgeons for analysis, they conducted that 50% of the subjects in the study were surgical candidates. These are the people going to gyms, engaging intense training programs like CrossFit and others, most often without any skillful training in exercise technique. It is exactly this kind of situation coupled with poor levels of general health that have led to a large number of people getting injured and not achieving their health and fitness goals, but often being in so much pain, they are debilitated and end up on multiple drugs needing surgery and frequently end up worse off than when they started going to a gym. Having seen this exact problem throughout my career and being a therapist to many such people and athletes of all skill levels that came to me for help with these kinds of problems. I felt it was my duty to develop IMS1 to both upskill health and exercise professionals so they know how to perform a holistic assessment and write a holistic coaching plan and to protect the public from unnecessary injuries and setbacks. IMS1 can be taken online at your leisure or attended live. What you will learn in this truly holistic training program is the essential check holistic principles, including how the male and female energies function through the autonomic nervous system and body, and how they relate to diet and lifestyle choices. You will learn the importance and application of my four doctor system that shows you how to create a holistic diet, exercise, and lifestyle plan, which includes training on doctor happiness, doctor movement, doctor diet, and doctor quiet. You'll learn why posture is essential to understand and how to assess posture and correct posture with the skillful application of joint mobilization, corrective stretching, and corrective exercise prescription. How to perform specific length tension assessments to identify muscle imbalance syndromes and training on the scientific application of stretching and joint mobilization for corrective purposes. You will learn how to determine an individual's overall levels of stress and design holistic exercise programs that produced enhanced well-being. Additionally, you will learn how to assess and correct abdominal wall dysfunction and restore core function to the spine, which will provide extremity stability and how to break down a case history and design a client-specific holistic program to meet the client's unique needs. To enter this foundational training program online or live, there are three essential prerequisite courses that must be completed so you have a holistic-based education and have the necessary knowledge to prepare for your Integrated Movement Science Level 1 training, and they are all included in the special offer we have for this month of April. They are our Scientific Core Conditioning e-learning course, Scientific Back Training e-learning course, and Program Design e-learning course, all of which can be done in the comfort of your own home at your own pace. When you purchase your IMS1 prerequisite bundle in April, you will save 15%. 
The IMS-1 prerequisites are not only essential for IMS-1 students, but will enhance any health or exercise professional's mastery of assessment and correction for the core, back, and greatly enhance the effectiveness of your program design skills. These prerequisite courses are also ideal for any exercise enthusiast or athlete that wants to learn, heal, and get it right the first time. No promo code is needed. Simply go to shop.chekinstitute.com. That's shop.chekinstitute.com and get started today. What, what I was pointing to, and you were alluding to it as well, and that is I was mentioning, you know, if let's say you're a family and you eat organic and you go to your local organic supplier, they're going to have a meat supplier. And that meat supplier is going to be getting their meat from the same farm. Yeah. And so they're going to get their vegetables from the same vendors, right? So what, what you, if you look into the research on organic farming and you look at things like analysis of nutrients, analysis of percentage of uh, the different, you know, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, saturated fats, et cetera, you, you can see the breakdown of scientific analysis. And what they find, for example, is if you, go to one organic farmer and analyze the meat in his sheep and get a nutrient profile. And then you drive 20 miles away to another farm and analyze the same breed of sheep, you'll get a very different profile. And so what they showed is it's actually the soil. It's the soil microorganisms. It's the quality of the plants they're eating. It's the nature of the nutrition coming from the soil. And it's how the farm is managed. Point being is, even if you're eating certified organic foods, if you're not getting a wide variety of them, you, you can still end up with a need for key nutrients because we're all as different on the inside as we are on the outside, right? Like me yeah. and you could be living in the same place, eating from the same soils, but you might need, maybe you're going through a, a challenging time at work or whatever. And, you, and I, I could say, oh, May, here's some ashwagandha that'll help you. But you're not going to get ashwagandha out of your, your vegetables in your farm because that's not something that's included in that. So because we're under so many stresses, we've got environmental stresses, chemical toxicity. I mean, one of the things that I've had to, to take women off consistently is I've had many women, I do environmental um, toxicity uh, testing. And I've had many women that were getting poisoned by their makeup. Wow. And they didn't know it. And so here's an example where you could be eating a really good diet, but not realizing that your body's being poisoned by your makeup. And the next thing you know, you're having all sorts of unusual symptoms. And so my point is really that we are all so unique that even the same stress or the same financial stress, the same relationship stress, the same work stress causes the need for different nutrients inside of each of us. And so why I think that's important is because we can't have enough farms to, to get all these nutrients. I mean, if I was to ask you to give me a list of all the ingredients that you use in your products and where they come from, it would probably cover a significant portion of the United States, if not the world. Yeah. And it would include probably 50 or 60 different farms, I would guess. Yes. Yeah. And a great example of this is when we were actually teaching juicing 10 years ago, just a kind of baseline um, aha moment for Drew and I, we had uh, in many of our recipes, we had turmeric. Uh, it was very common in San Diego, super easy to buy at Whole Foods. And we had a, a huge coaching group. Um, again, so much of where this product came from was literally coaching thousands of people through transformation with Whole Foods and juicing for you know all kinds of health benefits. But this turmeric recipe that we often used, it was commonly in, in the majority of our recipes, a really powerful anti-inflammatory uh, superfood, was unavailable for folks on the East Coast and kind of mid Midwest. And so they were having to buy it on Amazon and, and they were having a hard time finding even good quality they could buy on Amazon. So it was this aha moment that as we made our first products as Organifi, the brand that ultimately made, you know, at first juicing just so simple, it would solve that obstacle of getting high quality organic food in your kitchen. And the same great recipe that had things like ashwagandha, to your point in it, that honestly were not easy to get all, all the time, quite hard to source, and especially to keep in your diet consistently and enjoyably, had things like turmeric in it because they weren't something you could 
you know, be able to get year round well and high quality. And some people just didn't have access to it. So, you know, I think it's becoming a much larger issue. You know, we can talk about kind of the almost like food access crisis that's that we're bridging into. And I think that unfortunately, the future of food, if we don't start changing how we produce food, but so much of what started the the brand Organifi was solving some of those obstacles to living our healthiest life. And I think you know, in this manner, this is where supplements, ideally whole food supplements and superfoods. And like an example is, of course, what Organifi does is is bridging this gap and making it easier, removing that obstacle and supporting people as they do their best to incorporate whole foods and ideally organic whole foods that are grown to your point in really high quality soil. They can feel the health benefits of, of eating those foods regularly. Well, here's a paradox for you. I'm ready for it. Bill Gates and Anthony Fauci both really need a lot of Organifi in their diet, but as soon as they find out how good it works, they're going to try to get rid of you. It's a really scary uh, potential future we're looking at, I have to say. Yeah. and and, They're trying to make it illegal to be healthy. And just, I mean, I think regardless, we're going to see larger disparity in the access to high quality food and uncontrolled food or non-controlled food or food without oversight, you could say. So I think now is is a really important time to be connected with whether it's CSAs, you know, um, farmers markets, local farmers in your area, just because we don't know what's going to happen with that. And I think, you know, in a lot of ways, we are impacted by our sourcing, right? And ensuring that we're connected with great farmers worldwide. But, you know, there's, there's concern that that won't always be the case. Yes. So that brings up an interesting point. Um, I've got books in my library written in the 1940s on these issues. For example, the living soil and the Holly experiment by Lady Eve Balfour. Um, she really was one of the key pioneers that created the term organic farming. And I don't know if you've ever seen that book, but it's extremely well done and very, very shocking, the evidence she gives. But in a number of my books, something interesting pops up. They talk about private schools and they talk about various organizations that were doing tests on people's health and evaluating nutrition. And many of them found and there's other corporations like this as well, like I believe Standard Process ran into this trouble, that they could not get kids in schools healthy buying food in the stores. And this is in the 40s. So they wow. had no choice but to start their own farm. Another one I've got in my library you'd find mind blowing, blowing is called the Peckham Experiment from a mm. suburb in outside of London called Peckham. And I believe they started this project in 1938, but they wanted to do this huge kind of live-in community. They had 1,800 people. People would join in kind of a membership. They would have a home there. It was a full-blown community type thing. And I've got the books on the Peckham Experiment. There's two books, and they show comprehensive analysis of all their medical evaluations and you know who had parasites, who had this, who had high blood pressure. Very, very comprehensive. I mean, most people today wouldn't even know that stuff like this was being done all the way back. Then it actually got shut down because of the Second World War. But they were running this experiment. The point being is they came to the conclusion that they could not get the people in their organization healthy on the food that they could buy in the store. Now, this was way before we had big pesticide problems or anything. So they had to actually start their own organic farms and then they could get the people healthy. So the the point I'm driving at is is I wouldn't doubt it if pretty soon Organifi is going to have to start buying and creating its own source farms to protect itself from everything that's going on. Yeah, it's an impending nutrient crisis. <laughs> yeah. You know, we've talked a bit about it, but if you if there's anything else you'd like to add, what separates Organifi from other companies making foods, drinks, and supplements in the same categories? Now, obviously, I have my own ideas or I wouldn't <laughs> use Organifi, but I think for the listeners, there's so much out there. And, and as I said earlier, you know, you get all these famous athletes and movie stars and people just believe this stuff. And I, before you answer, I'll just say one thing that separates Organifi from these other companies everything you guys make actually tastes good. You know, most, a lot of the things that are healthy, you really got to kind of suck it up to put it in your body. I mean, I've had a long, I mean, I've been around for a long time. So when I started using Organifi stuff, one of the first thoughts I had is, wow, somehow Drew managed to make healthy stuff taste really good. 
but most mixed drinks like you 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 go buy a lot of these things at the s- stores or conferences and even if they're organic it tastes like you're eating something from a 1960 something hippie reservation or something you got to kind of stomach it. it's almost like chinese medicine so i got to give you credit you guys have really done a good <laughs> job of and i think it's important for the kids you, you manage to make healthy food taste good so with that preface do you have anything to add well, and, and most powerful of that coming from you rather than me, but yes, um, very much here to change the paradigm around how we expect healthy to be experienced, which is hard, disgusting, and short-lived uh, or out of our grasp. And so just we're here to, to shake it up for sure. And I, I definitely am <laughs> grateful for the fact that uh, the expectation is set to make delicious products going forward. And as we always have, and even our juicing recipes, it took us a long time to make them taste good. But the intention was you're juice fasting and you're, you're enjoying that drink four times right. a day. So it can't taste gross. And then yeah, that'd be tough. You know, yeah, you can't. You can't. I mean, and ha- habit architecture, you know, it has to be nine times better than what you're currently doing to adopt a new habit. So it's also the fundamentals of change that that drive some of that focus. But that's you know neither here nor there. That the piece that I think is is um interesting is you know we didn't start out as a drinks and supplements company by design. So that was not our intention or purpose or mission. We were focused on transformation. And as I touched on earlier. We worked, we, I mean, I, I ran coaching groups 10 years ago, did live transformation events with folks going through health, health transformation through the power of real food. We were an education company. You know, we didn't sell physical products. Uh, we just basically guided, guided folks through transformation. And I think that makes us really unique. We're, we're 10 years in the space. You know, so yes, I think that's worth mentioning. And with so many, uh, so many options today for supplements and products that are definitely being marketed by lots of celebrities and influence, let's say it's really important to, I think, for us to honor our origins, like, hey, we've been here for for a long time at this mission, and it hasn't changed uh, on purpose. It's been really steadfast and, and coming from the origins of working directly with people on life changing transformation. It's, you know, making those recipes by hand, as I was talking about, that actually drove the the creation of the products in the first place and solving that, you know, solving that obstacle to living their best life by saying, hey, what if we made a gently dried superfood recipe that took the place of some of this juicing for people, even if it was almost like a, again, supplemental <laughs> to them actually continuing to eat well. And that's the origin story. So I think really worth worthwhile in, in anchoring is that original intention and mission that we were on is has become an evolved um, Organifi. Yeah. You, made, you, you just made me think of something. I think it's in Lady Eve Balfour's A Living Soil and Holly Experiment book which I originally think was published in 43 or 46. But anyhow, they, they actually, it surprised me when I, when I read this. Uh, I probably read it 25 years ago. But they talk about studies showing that the sperm counts of males in England were dropping really drastically. And they compared the sperm counts of males, I believe, in 1938 with those in 1945. And they had come down like 50%. And then what they did is they took these males with low sperm count and they put them on different percentages of an organic diet. So 25% organic, 50% organic, and then a whole 100% organic. And they found that even with a 25% organic diet, that a sperm count would rise about 50% above where it was at. Half she gives the statistics. I can't remember the exact details, but 50% organic made another big improvement. And then 100% organic, of course, knocked the ball out of the park. Now, I bring that up because, look, we've got a, a, an epidemic of young men reaching out for testosterone replacement. And, and I've had countless over the years young men tell me they're night. We're I'm talking 19 year old athletes say that they have to use Viagra because they can't get an erection. And I'm like, looking at this, this is like, this means that our population is dying. You know, you're talking about 19 year olds that are acting like 70 year olds here. I'm bringing that up to make a point. And it was identified that long ago that even a 25% organic diet could significantly enhance a man's sperm count. And so even if a person is living what we would call the standard lifestyle, which neither you or I would subscribe to, but they're getting 25% of their diet from Organifi products. It could actually 
significantly enhance their vitality in many, many ways that they might not even realize it's doing it. It could be the improvement in the quality of their hair, the oils of their skin, their vision, their detoxification capacity, bowel movements, energy, mental clarity. And I think for a lot of people, it's a lot more likely that they're going to do that with the kind of products that you guys make at Organifi because it's much easier for them. And one of the things that people always complain about is the cost of organic foods. But I say you, you're misunderstanding something. There's numerous feeding studies that show the average animal and human being eats 30% less calories on organic food because they're getting the nutrients to trigger the satiety centers in the brain. So they just don't get as hungry because the nutrient density is there. So I think for, you know, we got to remember only 44 to 6% of all the food consumed in the world is, is certified organic food. So probably, believe it or not, I would, I'd be interested to see a survey of what percentage of the people that buy Organifi actually live on certified organic food. I would say it's probably most of what they're getting that's organic is coming from your products, but not the way they're eating as a general thing. So the point being is you can actually significantly enhance your diet with high quality organic foods, even in drinks and the kinds of products that you make. And what we're talking about, I think so powerfully, is giving our incredible bodies, right, these magical machines that we're living in, the right tools. And so to your point, I mean, and that that study is like just so mind boggling. Um, I definitely want to check out that book. Thank you. I have not read it yet. And just uh, the research that was done at that time um, and knowing how much, how many more chemicals and pesticides are in our regular food system, the, the fundamental need is to give our bodies the, the necessary nutrients to function as they expertly are able to. And it's incredible the repercussions when we don't, right? It is, it is early um, fertility issues. Um, yeah, uh, incontinence, like all kinds of unusual things that are happening in populations that wouldn't have ever happened before. You know, we're expanding our lifespans and there's a lot of concern with health spans. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> you know, we talked about that. Yeah. Let me give you a little information on that. Um, we're not really expanding our lifespans. That's a scientific misnomer. I've researched this. What you want to look wow. for is called age-adjusted lifespan. And I'll tell you why. Mm. Because all the studies that are looking at lifespan that say we're expanding our lifespan, which is often used to sell products and medical procedures. I don't doubt that. Here's what they do. You see, what they do is they look back through the records and they say, okay, uh, during the plague, this many people died. And so what happens is they're saying that we're living much longer, but they're including people that were in famines. They're including people that died in battle. They're including all the disease, all the uh, babies that, that died due to exposure because um, they're talking about lifespan, but they're not actually taking out people that died in things like traumas, um, or, or environmental stress or wars or environmental exposure. So it creates this false impression that we're living a lot longer. But if you take a person eating a hundred percent organic diet and throw them in a battlefield and they get shot in the head, you're not, it's not fair to include this, them in the statistics to make it look like we're living longer, if that makes sense. Wow. So when they do what's called age-adjusted lifespan, where it puts it on equal footing, the research shows that we're only living two years longer on average than we did in 1840. Oh my gosh. Yes. So if you want to look into that, you want to research age-adjusted lifespan. Yeah. And it makes sense, the inaccurate... Uh I guess, information otherwise, uh, considering all of the uh, not regular deaths, you could say irregular deaths. I'll give you an example of exactly how this plays out. If you read books about native cultures, they will often say these people didn't live beyond about 36 years of age, which is absolute crap. I've got loads of books in my library showing that these Native American Indians often reached 80, 90 years old. If you study the Hunza, um, uh, Sir Robert McCarrison, Major General Robert McCarrison, 
who was uh, in the British military. He was the head of medicine for the British military. During the First World War, they had to turn almost 50% of recruits away because they were so malnourished, they were unfit. They couldn't be uh, conditioned properly to be soldiers. In the Second World War, it went up to 51%. So the British government saw it as a threat to their national security. So they put Robert McCarrison, Major General Robert McCarrison, on the job of evaluating what was going on with the English population. So he did something very ingenious. He searched the world to find out who the healthiest people in the world were, and he found it was the Hunza of northern India. He went there, he analyzed their diets, he analyzed their life. He found men 110 years old that were still getting women pregnant and having babies and working in the fields at 110. Oh my God. Okay. How inspiring though. <laughs> so what McCarrison did was very, very interesting. He then took 2,000 rats and he broke them in two groups. He fed one a group modeled on the stand, standard English diet. He copied the standard English oh, no. diet, fed that group, and monitored their health, their 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 social relationships, the diseases they got, their lifespan, the problems they had with birthing, with mis miscarriage, with uh, birth diseases, malformations. And he put the other group of rats on the Hunza diet. The ones on the Hunza diet lived beautifully, had almost no diseases, had no miscarriages, no birth defects. The ones on the English diet had exactly the same proportion of diseases and the same diseases as the English population. It's so connected. It is connected. And you yeah. know what's really sad about that? It means, and I could cite many more studies like that. You've never seen my library, but Drew has. I could cite many more studies like that showing that the American government and the British government has known the exact truth about food and what it does and how important it is all the while. Last, my, my, I just wrote a chapter on nutrition for my new book and I looked up the, how much pesticides we're using in 10, the top 10 of 195 countries in the world in the year I believe the last statistics came in in 2020 because it takes them a long time to calculate it. 6.9 billion pounds of pesticides sprayed in only 10 countries. Okay. So you have to ask yourself why when we see pictures on television all the time of people wearing hazmat suits spraying crops, do people eat that? And why does the government allow that to happen when they have research all the way back to the Second World War showing that they didn't have enough recruits coming in that could pass the physical examination who were so unhealthy they couldn't even rehabilitate them to make soldiers out of them and had guys like Robert McCarrison spend multiple years doing extremely comprehensive studies that told them exactly what was wrong, yet they continue to allow this to happen in massive amounts. And to put that in perspective, May, most people can't fathom what 6.9 billion pounds of pesticides is. So I did a little math with my wife's help. I said, okay, I'm going to put this into perspective for you. A gallon of water weighs eight pounds. So if we took 6.9 billion pounds of pesticides, and said, how much water would that be? And how many bathtubs would that fill? It worked out to be something like 54 million 50 gallon bathtubs of pesticides being poured on our topsoil in only 10 of 195 countries every year. And then I researched, are there any countries in the world that are pesticide free? And the answer was no. God. Okay. It's terrifying. It's really scary. It's extremely scary. And I could go a lot further into it than that because I haven't, <laughs> I, even, I haven't even talked about chemical fertilizers. And that's a whole other ball of wax or ball of poison. What am I really saying? What I'm saying is the reason I'm excited about Organifi and because the companies that sponsor my podcast are all in the same value set is because people have no idea how, A, hard it is to source real organic food, 
how hard it is to to keep food clean of, of things like glyphosate, which is ruining people's health worldwide, and how important it is to not only your health and longevity, but disease prevention. The average person today spends over 14000 a year on medical expenses. I would venture to bet that 95% of that would be eliminated if they went to an organic lifestyle and followed the principles I teach on how to eat, move, and be healthy and ate organic food. I believe in that. And yeah. so all I'm saying is for the listeners, like what, why I am big on Organifi and people that really grow certified organic food and really produce these healthy products is because based on the research, even if 25% of your diet is organic, it can make a radical difference. And there's nothing better to measure that than sperm count, right? Um, that's the, the, a man's body puts all of its resources into its sperm because without it, we're all gone, right? You need sperm and you need eggs. And if you want to screw eggs up in a woman, just feed her junk food and pesticides. If you want to, and look what we have, we have a worldwide crisis of women who can't get pregnant and an in vitro fertilization industry that's worth billions and billions of dollars a year, which they try to do chemically and trick people. And our OBGYN is a genius. His name's Nathan Riley. And, and there's uh, uh, many great podcasts I've done with him on these very issues. And before I forget, did you happen to hear my podcast not too long ago with Fred Provenza? No, I haven't heard that one. I think Recent? I think you should listen to it. Fred Provenza is a famous animal scientist, feeding scientist, nutrition expert, taught in university for many years. His books are mind blowing, and Fred Provenza is a genius. And his podcast is awesome. And we're going to do a series of them. But you, as the CEO of Organifi, will be doing happy jacks in the air. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to Fred Provenza tell you the truth because he is a scientist that produced over 400 scientific papers on exactly what you were doing for a living and proved yeah. all these things that you found out the hard way doing exquisite animal studies. And he is an amazing man. Thank you. I would love to check that out, actually. And just grateful um, for you having him on as a guest and sharing that education. It's the animal science industry is such a and our food system clearly attached to that is such a representation of our understanding of health in many ways. Um, how we treat our food, uh, both animals and plants is, um, there's so much opportunity for us there. And I, I did want to add the, uh, couldn't agree more with the perspective on just our cellular health in, in showing up in whether it's men's sperm count or, and I think as, as a woman, so clearly in our cycle health. And so, especially for cycling females, um, you know, premenopausal, such a clear indication if, um, if you're experiencing PMS symptoms that are irregular um, and just that being a challenging experience, like the body again is such an incredible, and I keep saying machine, but there's a more beautiful word for that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> a divine uh, vessel that um, it's incredible how, what we are capable of, again, when when well-fed and when given the proper nutrients to live our best lives and optimally and in and, and, and vitality. I, 10 years ago, learned this lesson and so much of like my my personal learning and, and what health meant to me, the, re the redefining of it, as you talked about how individualized it is. And this is something I'm just incredibly passionate about. I'm having Organifi help folks individualize their health and why fascinated by adaptogens. My, my story in this area started 10 years ago and, and I'm, why I'm telling this is because it is around just the hormonal health of, of me, me being a woman, that experience of recognizing I could be, I was eating a paleo diet. I was intermittent fasting at the time in the personal training field 10 years ago. That was a, a big, big thing. thing. Yeah. So I was in intermittent fasting. I was um, uh, working out seven days a week. I was strength training. I was generally eating low carb. And I, um, I experienced amenorrhea. So I lost my cycle. I was 25 at the time, a very irregular, not natural, let's say, and uh, definitely not normal. And my blood work was uh, I had the highest inflammatory markers I'd seen at my blood work, in my blood work. And I also had the most nutrient deficiencies. So at the time, I wasn't eating organic. I was eating high quality, but paleo diet. And so I was just missing a lot of food variety, as you talked about. So this really taught me the importance of eating seasonally 
And anyways, this wake up call was for me, I could be doing all the right actions, let's say, but if I wasn't focused on quality and if I wasn't focused on supporting the stress levels, my stress levels, right? In fact, I was actually increasing my stress by over-exercising, under-eating, under basically like providing nutrients, right? You mean you were being a typical American female? 100%. Yeah. And the, the hard learned lesson was how clearly that did not work. And it was a, you know, the experience of thinking, wow, I may never have, have kids if I don't resolve this. You know, I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't resolve my fertility. And so I worked with a naturopath and I spent about six months, almost a year uh, working to rebuild my, my cycle back. And it took you know, lots of nourishing foods, lots of really gross smoothies, really horrible smoothies at the time. And um, supplementing with superfoods. I was taking maca, um, really great products that were just hard to take consistently, but I did and got my cycle back. And a beautiful lesson is, and what I'm passionate about today is even our, our Harmony product is a beautifully nourishing product I wish we had had 10 years ago. Uh, I would have I would have definitely enjoyed that as a as a woman to support my cycle um, and just to be nourished on the hormonal level and to offset the stress I had experienced. So just a, a great example of, again, someone with all the right intentions, a lot of the right education, but misapplied uh, to myself individually. And without supporting myself with adaptogens and superfoods, I was overstressed and felt the repercussions of that in a really intense way. Hi everyone, please raise your hand if you enjoy having dried out, aged looking skin, wrinkled skin, acne, skin blemishes that make you look unhealthy, or skin that itches from lack of supportive nutrients. No hands? Just what I expected. You know, even though I'm a 60 year old man, I still want healthy skin because looking good helps me feel good too. Our skin is a living barrier that protects us from the sun, the elements, and a myriad of invasive organisms that try to enter us through our skin. Anyone that understands skin knows that good complexion begins on the inside, and that's exactly why Organifi created Organifi Glow, so you and your family can be healthy, stay young, and feel and look great from the inside out. My family and I love Organifi Glow, and so does our skin. This refreshing blend of organic nutrients not only tastes great, it supports your body's innate collagen production and promotes brighter, radiant skin. Boost your hydration and nourish your skin with 13 clinically studied superfoods. And unlike most companies that claim to be organic, Organifi does use certified organic nutrients and has been the only company that could show me their certifications upon request. Organifi Glow supports and promotes collagen synthesis so you regenerate beautiful skin naturally, supports and promotes hydration, nourishes your skin from the inside out by optimizing skin hydration. Organifi Glow includes Tremella Mushroom, which provides five times the moisture of hyaluronic acid, which is commonly used in skin products to increase moisture. Organifi Glow offers a delicious raspberry lemonade taste, but unlike most plant-based products, is certified to be free of glyphosate, which is extremely important today. It also includes plant-based collagen from bamboo, which is a very rare ingredient because most collagen is animal-based. Not only that, Organifi Glow includes bioavailable vitamin C from Ace of Rolla Cherry with all its natural cofactors that support absorption and supports your immune system at the same time. Additionally, it's important to remember that your skin is often a reflection of your gut health. The collagen and prebiotic fiber in Organifi Glow has been shown to improve gut health by repairing the gut lining and feeding healthy bacteria in our microbiome, so not just your skin, but your whole body gets nourished. To get your Organifi Glow and love your skin, go to Organifi.com forward slash check 20. And I'll even make it better. All Living 4D listeners get 20% off when they use the promo code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. So your promo code is CHECK20, all in caps. Enjoy Organifi Glow. We love it. I love it. And I know you will too. I just wrote a note that I wanted to share with you. There's a very good book called Science in Agriculture by Arden B. Anderson, who Mm. is an unusual guy because he has a PhD in soil science and he's also a DO. And he is a doctor in the Air Force who takes care of uh, pilots, mostly if I remember right. And um, in his book, he shares something very profound. And, And even though it's called Science in Agriculture, I think you'd find it fascinating. It's really a good book. 
but he shows that in the rhizosphere or the root space of space of plants, you can find pretty much every hormone that is in a human body. And he says that what we call vitamins are actually plant hormones. Wow. So the point I'm driving at here is if we keep turning to medical stuff and pills and chemicals, when really usually the problem is, is that we don't have enough variety in our diet and we're not eating high enough quality plants, we can't get the plant hormones that support our own hormonal system and our own physiology. So, you know, eating a variety of foods, and that's another thing that I like about Organifi, because if you actually start looking at all the ingredients, you, you can see a lot of these things are not people, various mushrooms and and various herbs that most people would never even really know what their benefits are until they actually ask the question or somebody pointed it out to them. And it's coming from certified organic soil. So you're, you're actually able to get a variety of nutrition that you might not even find on a lab test because most people don't have a comprehensive enough lab test to, to identify exactly what you're missing. And if they do find you're missing it, they want to give it to you in some synthetic format or or some isolation isolation pill but i'm saying well look all you got to do is go look at what plants carry that substance in them and then you're getting not only are you getting that substance but you're getting in its natural form in which it is in a synergistic format with all the other plant chemicals phenolics terpenes alkaloids vitamins minerals trace minimal trace minerals enzymes, they all have to be together because as Royal Lee showed, he, he showed that there's no such thing as a vitamin that functions in isolation in nature. And the analogy that Royal Lee gives, and Royal Lee is the founder of Standard Process Laboratories, which is very high quality products. Um, he said, to, give a, to make his point, he said, what part of a watch tells time? <laughs> well, the answer is the whole thing, right? You can't take any piece out of a watch and still have a functional watch. So he said that a vitamin in nature functions as a complex with fats, proteins, carbohydrates, minerals, trace minerals, phenolics, terpenes, alkaloids, enzymes. And that is what makes the vitamin complex work. So as soon as you start isolating vitamins out, he says that your body then has to scavenge all the rest of the components to make the watch work. And when you take piles of B6 or this or that, you can actually trigger nutritional deficiencies in other areas of your body because in order to use it, your body has to pull all these other nutrients to assemble the complex. So, you know, having whole food organic, what we would call supplements, but it's the wrong concept. It's really, we call it supplements because we understand the term, but what we're doing and what you're doing is really putting nutrition in there that gives the body what it needs to produce a specific result, whether it be stress reduction, inflammation control, et cetera. And I think a lot of people just, you know, the whole nutrition industry has been railroaded by food manufacturers. In fact, the, the, uh, most people don't know this, but what we call the degree in nutrition was founded by food manufacturing corporations. It wasn't by holistic thinkers. It came from food manufacturing corporations. Yes. So I say that I get nutritionists in my holistic lifestyle coaching program all the time. And I say, how many of you that are, are certified nutritionists? And I usually have anywhere from two to 10 of them. I say, how many of you, when you went to school, got trained in soil science? None of them. I've never had a single hand go up. I say, I got bad news for you. You don't know anything about nutrition yet. You can't. It's impossible. You know about chemicals. You know about isolated yep. products and you know about the allopathic model of using this for that, but you still don't understand nutrition. Because until you understand the microorganisms, the soil, soil cycles, seasonal cycles, temperature, and all the variables that go into it, you don't understand what makes nutrition. And therefore, you can't. It'd be like a carpenter that's never built a foundation before. How could you be a carpenter without knowing how to build the foundation of a house? Yeah. And in being studying an ag science and an ag college, I experienced that indoctrination firsthand, right? I left school believing that GMOs were our future right? So it was a full indoctrination. 
in the direction that very much big ag wanted the mindset and growing practices to go, not in the fundamentals of nutrition. So I learned it in that reverse way that you're talking about too, with the fundamentals of growing up on an organic farm. And so to your point, as as complex and intelligent as our bodies are, so so is the food that we consume to get the benefit and to be nourished by. You know, as you're talking about the polyphenols and kind of how how plants benefit our bodies, you know, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we only know like one percent of um, of phytonutrient science right now. The, uh, the understanding of how plants work in our body. And Fred Prevens is an expert on that, by the way. Um, oh, yeah, so cool. he's. Uh, I'll I'll share some stuff with you. Um, I'm sure I'll I'll copy him. I'll introduce you to him because he's a, a an amazing human being. I mean, you definitely want to listen to my podcast with him. But he's got amazing slideshows on all the phenolics, terpenes, alkaloids, chemicals, and plants. And he's, that's one of his fields of research. He's also an expert on the nutrition and meat. And he's been one of the key pioneers of showing that the whole vegetarian movement um, and the attack on meat is not having nutrition is, is, is completely and utterly scientifically wrong. Um, what, what this leads us to my next question, um, as I spec, you are very well aware, most people think of food as fuel and only see food as an energy source. The result being um, is that they see food as calories, not for nutritional value and content. And the result is that people shop for food like they shop for gasoline or a toaster oven or laundry soap. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on the origins of that misconception, the ultimate cost of that mindset and way of engaging food, not only to the individual, but to the planet, and the impact that mindset can and is having on the growth, development, health, and body-mind integration of our children. Yeah, this is a, a massive topic and <clears throat> and I think it's really it's a it's in my in my perspective it stems from the disconnection with food. So the misunderstanding of what food is and how it how it how we interact with it I'll even say not even how it serves us but how we interact with it is at the root of this and you know it's it's alarming how few people understand how you know that there's no such thing as a baby carrot, right? A baby carrot is made. Yes, <laughs> they, they don't grow out of the ground. Um, and, and even the seasons in which food grows in, um, it's it's incredible that disconnection. So I I, I think some of this antidote uh, to better understand and better even see the benefit of eating real food is first a, a reeducation and a reconnection and as simple as like growing growing a. a any plant in your house is part of that, but growing something you can eat is quite a humbling experience to recognize how a plant has grown. Most of my, I think most powerful life lessons were learned in the garden growing up. And it took me, you know, most of my life to really understand those and apply them to today, but you can't really replace that. So I think the perception that food is fuel is this kind of robotic, um, inhuman way to relate to nutrients that is inaccurate and unfortunately missing a huge opportunity to better understand the nature of ourselves and our bodies. And, and the, the energy around that is, uh, is really cold. And so, yeah. you know, you, you miss most of the, most of the, uh, key indicators of health. If you're just tracking your macros, let's say, and if you're just looking at calories, I think the propensity, like how this this mindset shows up in consumer demand is based on discount food, not based on quality, uh, certainly not based on sustainability. So if, if we don't understand how food is made, we don't understand how to produce food, we also don't understand how important soil is, to your point, and we don't understand what it will take to maintain and even, even better that. I think what's incredible is the other side of this, you know, relatively scary conversation around the the potential to continue losing connection with food. The other side of that is this really fascinating conversation as we as we begin to understand even the science of mycelium more, the science of, of soil more, what's possible? You know, what could we create with that connection being deep and that connection being well understood? Um, we can create life. A, yeah, yeah. What a concept. Yeah. Instead of all the death, we can create life. Yeah. You know, you talked about the body as a machine. I'd say the, the, the body is, is a body of nature and nature is, is. life producing. And we, we, we have to remember that the principles that guide nature are alive in us. And to the degree that we abort, abuse, or ignore those principles, we end up with $14,500 a year in medical bills 
And uh, that's a lot of Organifi products. That's a lot of certified organic <laughs> food. And that's a lot of money that could be going back into the rehabilitation of the planet instead of the destruction of the planet in the name of bogus science and corporate greed. You're right. Yeah. Um, you mentioned something there about the experience of being raised on a farm and and you know, and you you suggested people just get a plant and grow it, and and you you'll see it. It's like having an animal. You've got to take care of it. Shockingly, yeah. I mean, you you have to. It has to have sunlight. You have to give it water. You've got to, you know, pay attention to if its leaves are changing color. Or, you know, you, there's a lot of things. I mean, I I really have a deep personal relationship with all my plants, and we have 14 acres here that we are farming on and raising animals, and so. What I wanted to share with you that most people aren't aware of, and I've got the research right in my library, during the First and Second World War, when men got drafted into the military and had to leave the farms and women took over the farms, production went up significantly on the farms when the men were gone. And when the men came home, crop production fell back down again. Challenges with animals giving birth and all that stuff got worse. And what the research showed is because women's nurturing ability was felt by the plants and animals and they responded to feminine love and care where men just treated the plants like and animals like objects. Wow. that I've never heard that. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, that's why I read a lot of the science from you know 40 50 years ago because then you had real scientists that weren't on the payrolls of corporations and as the old Funded. as the old saying goes it's very hard to change someone's belief system when their paycheck depends on it yeah that's very true it, uh, even all the subsidies right in the food system um so much of that is um becomes very clear when you just follow where the funding is coming from who is paying for this and why yes is there anything else you wanted to share on our previous question there before I move on? No, thank you. I think that's an important one to look at. And just it's a it's a shifted perception with with food and and well actually I will add one thing. Thank you, Paul. I I think sometimes the the invitation to have an experience growing food might not be available. And so something that that I find no longer living on a um, uh, you know property where we produce our own food, which I, I greatly miss living in downtown San Diego, um, what I do and, and really enjoy is going to, um, we've got some local uh, community farms here that you can go tour, whether with your family. If I have friends visiting, we'll go out there and go on a, just a, go for a walk with the, um, the agriculture team. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a, eye-opening experience to better understand. And I think it's a it's a fundamental practice um, as we open our awareness and just expand our awareness to what it takes to you know bring a particular crop to uh, fruition and and to run through a production cycle um, and and nourish that plant to your point. It takes uh, so much education and awareness. Um, and and just that eye-opening experience the next time you're eating broccoli or whatever the, the food is, you know, you have this expanded appreciation for what you're putting in your body. So I, I believe even something as simple as that, maybe it's going to a farmer's market, maybe it's watching, you know, some, some videos that help just expand your, your perception and understanding of, of food uh, has a lot of benefit. So I always want to take time to, to make it approachable and easy to reconnect with the food in so many different ways. So uh, that's a great option as well is find a local farm, go tour it, see if you can walk, you know, the land with anyone that, that produces it. Normally they have a lot of family um, ability to take kids out to farms locally and do events and stuff. And I think it's just great to have that form of connection as well. Yeah. You know, the thing is farming plants or animals is really a, about relationships. It's all about relationships and it's about paying attention. You know, my father's rule was the plants and the animals get taken care of before you eat. And that's not a rule you wanted to break, I can <laughs> promise you. You know, you, if you got caught sitting at that I breakfast bet. table before animals were fed and water or plants were taken care of, you probably would remember it for the rest of your life. I can assure you. And so um, now that's not the ideal way to teach a kid, but the... The point is, is that my father's yeah. awareness of the fact that you had to care for them, that they weren't products that you're making in a factory. They're living organisms that have to have attention and have to, you, they have to be observed and you have to look for things like hoof rot or, you know, forever 
things like cows. I don't know how yeah. they do it, but sometimes cows would somehow manage to fo- swallow chunks of barbed wire a foot long, and then they would stop giving milk and get sick, and we'd have to hire a vet, and they'd stick these long magnets down their throat into their stomachs. The stuff they would pull out would be mind blowing. Yes. I'm like, how in the yeah, nails, fence nails, nails barbed stuff, wire, right? pieces yep. of car fenders. And I'm like, how in the hell does a cow eat that? You know, <laughs> I, I saw that many times firsthand and it blew my mind every single yeah. time. <laughs> so, you know, you, oh, yes. you got to be involved, right? You can't just park them in yeah. a factory farm and feed them crap and let them live in their own pee and poop for the rest of their life and then sell that as top notch beef. I mean, that's just crazy. And Paul, I mean, I think you're bringing up something really fundamental also is the relationship allows for awareness of what that natural state is for whether it's a house plant you're caring for or a pet you're caring for, or to your point, a a farm that you're, you know, in, in, in charge of taking care of. And, and similar to our human bodies, if we're not tuned in to what our normal state is, if we're not self-aware enough to recognize and we're out of balance because we're not in touch with ourselves, we, we can't tell if something's out of order. We can't tell if something needs to be addressed. And so I think there is this, um, uh, this ho- hopeful future that one, there's a, um, a encouragement and a, um, made more approachable way to reconnect with our bodies and our state of health, you know, even to your point of the, the assessment that you would do to ask these questions to raise awareness around our state of health personally. But I mean, that goes right back to our, our food and taking care of animals, taking care of plants. It's, it's a relationship. It's like any other, other relationship. It's a labor of love. And, you know, you've been married for how long? Seven years. Seven years. Well, this year, seven years. Been together for uh, over, over 10, 12, 12 years. Well, then you know what the work of love really means, don't you? <laughs> well, I feel like we're, we're still real new at it, but I certainly believe I do. <laughs> well, you know, the it's point a- is a lot of people think, oh, we're going to have sex every day and, and giggle and laugh our way through life. But, you know, I always say to people, look, there's good sex and then you got to deal with each other for 23 more hours. And that's the work of love. So if you think, <laughs> if you think that uh, just because someone's got a nice ass and and uh, they give you an orgasm that uh, that's the rest of your life, then you're, you're in for a real shock. I and mean, the point I'm making is farming is no different, right? There's, it's a labor yeah. of love. Things happen. You know, animals get sick. They get attacked by other animals. They don't get along with each other sometimes. You have to, sometimes the pens are too small. You know, there's, there's so much. And, and, you know, coming from a farm like I have and you have, if you look at what's being done, to plants and animals, it's it's worse than being in a concentration camp. And 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 yeah. we forget these are living beings. I mean, God, all you got to do is read the book The Secret Life of Plant, Plants by Tom, Tompkins and Bird. And then look at all the research Cleve Baxter did. He showed how radically conscious plants and even bacteria are. Right. Uh, I don't know if you I'll give you one example of Cleve Baxter's work, which is mind-blowing. He went to the store and I think he bought like a standard carton of yogurt. He took that yogurt, put some of it into a test tube, had his lab assistant drive 50 miles away, hook the yogurt up in the van to a polygraph machine to monitor any electrical reactions to it, stress reactions. Cleve Baxter in the lab in the laboratory, fifty miles away, with the other half of the yogurt in the container, then had the intention to burn it or harm it, and both of them automatically reacted with a huge stress reaction. And fifty miles away, every time he threatened the the yogurt in the laboratory, the one fifty miles away reacted exactly as though it was going to be hurt. Yeah, to respect and honor and love our food. He showed that these. Bacteria are talking to each other 50 miles away, which goes against Newtonian science like crazy. I mean, I could get into the science of that, but it would be a long technical discussion. But the reality of it is we're dealing with life and we are the compilation of that. I mean, look at all the research on the microbiome and how critical that is to our emotions, our hormonal system, our our detoxification systems, our genetic diversity. I mean... People are only now finding out through science what farmers knew 200 years ago. <laughs> you know? I was just going to say that. I was like, in, in, in ag, it was pretty, 
pretty consistently understood that we were feeding the bacteria in the cows. And in many ways, like cows are actually the biggest carnivores ever because they only ate actually the bacteria. Right. <laughs> they were giving the bacteria grass. Yeah. Right? That's how they can convert so highly uh, yeah. with energy. I mean, they're huge animals eating grass. How does that work? Well, it's because they're full of bacteria. And if an animal was sick, you know, we had cannulated cows and we would displace that sick bacteria in the cow and we'd actually take bacteria from right from the stomach, one of the four stomachs of a healthy cow, and we'd put it right into a, a, a sick cow. And it, it was incredible to watch how fast that cow recovered once its bacteria was properly restored. It just goes to show you, you can't measure power by size. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, to your point, we're, we're just a, a, a huge mass of cells, so much of that being bacteria. And so how do we care for this vessel well? Well, not, the other thing we haven't touched on, this is very important. I mean, it's a little side sidetrack, but I'm going to bring it up because it's important. We are 99.99% water by molecular count. Mm. Like you may, you are 99.99% water by molecular count. And the reason I bring that up is look at what is done to our water and what is done when water is used on commercial farms and mixes with pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, rodenticides, and chemical fertilizers, and that gets into the plant and then you eat it. So you're actually taking water and poisoning it with chemicals that cannot be filtered out. And so wow. not only are you eating the plant, but you're eating poison water. And it's destroying the water that then sinks back into the earth and gets into the environment and then ends up in your city water systems. And so, you know, water is an extremely critical aspect of all aspects of health on this planet and the health of your own body because you can drink tap water and it's got fluoride in it, which kills bacteria. So you're just destroying your own microbiome right there. You know, so then you go to get all these pills and you're, you know, doing what whatever your idea of health is not realizing that you're actually your own worst enemy by just poisoning yourself with <laughs> scientifically validated fluoridated water yeah and and what i think um interesting is specifically pesticides and herbicides such as glyphosate are also water soluble so yeah they are you know in our in our uh environment uh for the next how many you know, decades because they're up in the clouds, they're coming down as rainfall that has glyphosate in it. So it's not something that's easy to remove. And I think part of why, you know, I hope this is the first of many um, certifications. We work with the Detox Project to certify our ingredients for glyphosate residue free, even though we also certify them as USDA organic. So after we get the ingredients, the finished product is tested for glyphosate residue free. If it doesn't pass, it's sent back. Because while we know, again, the fundamental thing we've been talking about is how important organic practices are at the farm level. And beyond that, we also want to take extra precautions for the realities you're talking about now that are super scary. You know, tons of toxins, ton tons of pesticides in the air and in the water. And so, you know, how, how do we shore up good quality food and good quality access to that and ensuring that the food we're putting in our body is, is chemical and pesticide free to our best ability? Well, you know, what's really sad about all this is that the bottom line this all boils down to a board of directors that are only interested in financial gain. It has nothing to do with anything but money. It, yeah. and, and, and the sad part of it is I wonder what the hell do they feed their children? You know, what, what do they think is going to happen to their own future? They, they get so in love with their money, they forget that they actually live on a planet that has to be taken care of because if it's not, they're dead too. And you know what? You, you can't eat money. I'm sorry. It just doesn't work. I haven't tried it, but I'm smart enough to know not to try. I wouldn't try it. I haven't either, but I don't recommend it. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're talking a lot about organic and I'm curious, how do you Organifi protect yourself and your customers from being deceived by pseudo organic organizations? Because right now there's approximately a hundred organic certifications and my research has shown only about four or five of them are actually real organic certifications. I think the gold standard is the Demeter Association. Um, but real organic certifiers require that you have your soil tested. And then mm -hmm. based on chemical analysis, you have to have the soil scientists make suggestions as to how to balance your soil and remove toxins, such as 
pesticide residues, and they won't let you sell your food as certified organic till your soil passes the soil science testing to make sure that it's not toxic to people. So the sad part of it is, is a huge percentage of the food people are eating that's certified organic isn't actually organic. And for those of you listening, if you ever want to do a test to find out if it's a real certification, just pretend you're a farmer, call up, you know, Martha's organic certification, just look at it, whatever you're buying, it says certified by so-and-so, call them up and say, what does it take for me to get certified by your organization? And if it does not require a toil, soil test and about a two-year gestation period or a period where your soil has to be retested, it's a bogus certified certified organic. Why that's important? Because you're paying the price for real organic food, but you're getting commercially raised food under a fake label. Yeah, really key. And with the just the boom of clean label certifications that have come out for marketing reasons, the last specifically the last 10 years has been uh, pretty scary. And at Organifi, we just use two that we know and trust. So we just use USDA Organic and we just use CCOF. And so those are the only certifiers we use. And um, until you know, we've done research that shows another certification does the proper testing and hold the proper standards, we we don't use that certification. And and specifically working with then also our sourcing companies that are very much farm level. If we're not, um, like those are the relationships that we've trusted in for ten years now and and tested on ten years now. And so I think for us it looks like probably a, a little bit of a limited. Um, sourcing potential because we trust that and we're aware that there's a lot of corner cutting um, and the amount of work that goes into maintaining organic certification is really important. Well, I look into my crystal ball and see Organifi owning their own certified organic farms in the near future because you're probably going to find that your supplies are going to dry up, especially with all the Bill Gates crap and World Economic Forum crap going on. You know, they're trying to get rid of anything that can allow you to be healthy. Yeah, I, I worry that the incentive, to your point, the the financial model doesn't fit the quality model that we really, really prioritize and depend on. So I'm excited for that. I feel like it's even more returning to my roots at that point, Paul. So I'm, yeah. I'm up for it. You, <laughs> but, maybe your mom and dad will be the farm directors. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, Drew's got a beautiful organic garden right now. He got a big, big um, greenhouse, actually. I know that is new property. But yeah, I've, I've always been like, hey, I'll have my parents come out. They'll do some consulting. Uh, they'll so they'll actually just probably want to work on the, on the garden, let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I know. I don't mind. That's great. Uh, my next question, May, is as a nutritionist, I'm sure you're well aware that the best nutrition comes from consuming whole foods that are organic. The more cutting, slicing, dicing, processing done to any food stuff, the more oxidation and nutrient depletion there is and the lower the quality of the food product becomes. So could you share what measures Organifi takes to minimize nutri nutrient loss and keep food as close as to its natural state as possible? Yeah, and this is a big one. Remember, coming from and just our conversation, coming from juicing this fresh food and moving into a powdered format, we talked about oxidization mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and and just the importance of making sure that we can maintain quality. We had in the beginning um, a lot of assessment done with powders instead of juices when we were actually juicing. And so, as you made a physical product, this was really key to focus on doing our best to minimize the kind of denaturing of that that product and keeping it in its most whole form. One, it shows up as as whole food sources of ingredient. And there's a couple of measures that, that I'll mention, which I think are really relevant. And it's picking the ingredients at their peak of production. So their uh, season, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Which is really key. And then with our whole foods, they're, they're, fra they're um, freeze dried. So it's, it's kind of the, the most... Um, for now, the most effective way to get these in products. Um, and that's different than, and I will say, we are gently drying them. And so a, a huge, <laughs> because we had such a big juicing community, a huge part of our uh, education was the temperature that we gently dried the ingredients to because we had so many, uh, so much of our community that was worried about over drying the food and, and losing the nutrient content of these, um, you know, foods that they had been juicing prior. So I always want to anchor this in saying that, or ground in, in the reality that, 
the real food is better. Like there, there isn't a comparison. There isn't a comparison to something that's been um, processed in any way and then uh, preserved. I think. I think the real food, fresh picked, you can't replace that. Um, and even the thing you buy in the grocery store, the thing you picked from the ground is better. <laughs> and so there's these these like layers of of excellence. And so on the whole food side, again, we we pick fresh. Um, the the Raw materials are harvested at their peak and they are freeze dried, gently dried in that process outside of it. The adaptogens, though, it's a different process because a lot of these are um, very specific herbs and they, especially if they're extracted and standardized, mm. they um, also go through a gentle drying uh, in that process just to go through the extraction ex- experience or process, you could say. And that's either in alcohol or water. And so it's just isolating the active constituents. And we have a lot of sensitivity to in any way um, how extraction process is done um, and really a high preference for whole foods in their most natural format. One, because that was our standard we were starting from in literally juicing the ingredients and or harvesting the ingredients fresh. So that's how we do our best in this in this place and intend to continue, especially as um, if technology improves in our ability to collapse that. Um, and I, I I'm really actually, I'll add this note, I'm really fascinated by how to bring the seasonality back to eating. And it's this odd juxtaposition that I I find Organifies in because we are a D to C, a direct to consumer brand. We sell our products year round. Uh, there's a couple seasonal products which I think are great um, and important, but you know, there's it's kind of this everything always available, and that's not that's not true for nutrition. You know, that's not, that's not actually how food is produced and how our human bodies are designed to benefit from foods. And I think there's this really important, um, remembering of uh, seasonality for our nutrients, for our, um, you know, it looks like going to a farmer's market and buying the seasonal vegetables. It looks like, you know, and, and I'm curious how brands like Organifi can start reconnecting with that. And it might just be more seasonal, um, production of ingredients, um, that's one way to do it, but I'm I'm quite excited by uh, reconnecting consumers to that in a in a really approachable way. That's always kind of our way to how do you make this easy? How do you make this good for you? How do you make this good for the planet? Kind of mentality. I think for me, uh, you know, if you were to come to me as a consultant and say, "How do we do this?" My answer would be, you have two different categories that you're working in. You have food that can be sold as products seasonally, which the the key underlying principle has to be educating. Like, why are we only selling this in the summer, this only in the fall, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then you have the medicinal application. So like if you've got someone who's got menstrual challenges in the winter, but there's a summer supplement, (laughs) like a say turmeric that is going to be medicinal, then you say, okay, we're going to use this out of season medicinally yes. to uh, get a specific result. But the ultimate goal is to bring you back into balance. So then you can go back into our seasonal food plan and then be back in harmony with nature. So I think it's a two pronged approach eating to be healthy and then using it as medicine to balance. So you can get back into the cycle that you got thrown out of that led to the need of this medicinal. You're hired. Let's go, Paul. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. That's so well broken out. You're right. I'm so busy already. <laughs> when you got a minute, let's chat. <laughs> yeah, well, that. you know, I get to chat with you right now. So <laughs> there you go. Free consulting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. As, as this line comes out, we will have to give you credit. <laughs> All right. You can call it the uh, check line. <laughs> check line. <laughs> check for health. There, there it is. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the show. You know, people worldwide are not only finding it hard to find organic and free-range, regeneratively farmed animal foods, but as you surely know, it's almost impossible to find anything worth eating in stores, airports, gas stations, or even in the stores that should have real food. Additionally, most children are sent to school to eat microwave processed, chemically raised, and chemically laden garbage from school cafeterias or out of their lunchbox simply because most parents just aren't aware of the dangers of commercial food. But the truth is, there are no shortcuts to health and wellness. Unless, of course, you let Paleo Valley do the work for you. 
Autumn Smith, founder of Paleo Valley, is not only a mother who understands the importance of feeding children wholesome, clean foods, but is a holistic nutritionist who pours her soul into all Paleo Valley products. And Paleo Valley's meat sticks are made from regeneratively farmed animals that are raised with the highest possible standards of care. Paleo Valley's meat sticks are also fermented, which significantly enhances the nutritional quality and flavor of them. My family and I love them and carry them everywhere we go, be it during rides in the car, outings, ski trips, or we put them in the kids' lunchbox and they love them. In fact, many people I know resort to them as a meal when time is tight on the road or traveling by air. I know of no better portable food or snack food anyone can eat without losing quality or satisfaction, and we love sharing them with our guests and students at our Rainbow Workshops. Paleo Valley's meat sticks come in beef, turkey, and pork maple bacon flavor. To get your meat sticks, go to P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. That's paleovalley.com. To save 15% on your purchase, use the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15. That's check 15 at checkout. And while you're there, check out Paleo Valley's other excellent foods and whole food supplement offerings and your body and your family will love you for it. Enjoy Paleo Valley. I know I sure do. Here's a, a question that I wanted to ask you, and I'm glad you didn't take it out of the outline because I, you know, I, I haven't got a chance to know you deep enough to see how you'd respond to a question like that. But my question for you, May, is what is your conception of spirituality? And mm -hmm. how do you feel the food people consume influences their spiritual development? So what is spirituality to May? And how does food influence spiritual development? I loved this question. Thank you for asking it. And I was raised with like Mother Nature essentially being the source of spirituality in, in my younger years and really honoring the gosh, the immense gifts that Mother Nature had to provide in our garden and how, you know, how, how the garden worked. And um, to understand it was a form of spirituality very much. My, my mom has um, a lot of uh, Native American influence in, in how she sees the world. And so, so much of that was honoring the um, property that my parents maintained and, and took care of. And so in many, in, in so many ways, that was really my introduction to spirituality early on in my life. And what I believe in today is nourishing and kind of how I relate this to food is nourishing my body, uh, my form of self-care, uh, and, and I'm not even putting this out there in, in for other folks, but just for me personally, um, is a really fundamental and kind of the first form of spirituality. It is, uh, again, honoring Mother Nature. It's also like, in a more broader sense, honoring God's gifts. So as we, if and when we don't do this, um, it is, uh, I think, such a disservice to what is made available for us. And there is a deep spirituality in that, in my mind and in my you know, with the reality I live in. So, it, you know, it can be the universe, it can be God, it can be Mother Nature, but it is the practice of nourishing our bodies and honoring the gifts that are in front of us. You know, there's several definitions of spirituality, but a couple of them that I think are important that I'll share with you, and they go hand in hand with what you've just shared. One definition is spirituality is progressively connecting to a greater whole. So the practice yeah. of living spiritually is to progressively become aware of, connect to, honor, appreciate, and engage a greater whole. So first you think the world is just chemicals. Then you realize the world is actually a, a process of a natural process we call nature. So your greater whole has just expanded to include nature. Then you realize that nothing in nature could happen without the moon and the sun. So now your sphere of what you relate to as essential to the whole that you're part of has grown. Then you say, wait a minute, the sun and the moon couldn't be here without the galaxy and the galaxy couldn't be here without the universe. And then the next thing you know, you're like, where'd the universe come from? Well, you know, it depends which camp you go. It, it, it either was an accident uh, that has about a 20 trillion to one chance of ever happening, or it's the creation of a source of love and intelligence that we commonly refer to as God which would be the, oh, the guiding intelligence that is expressing itself in physical form as life. So beautiful. 
And another example of or definition of spirituality is to engage in relationship with what is essential and core to your life and your survivability. Mm. And either way you go, you end up at the same place. Yeah. And it's beautiful. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to share for the listeners too, but, you know, to take what you shared about caring for your body, ask yourself this question. What would happen to May's body if the sun didn't shine for a month? What would happen to May's body if the moon disappeared? Well, she certainly wouldn't have a hormonal cycle. She wouldn't be a woman anymore. She'd be a physical thing with sex organs that don't work, that had seasonal affective disorder and was very depressed. And so, you know, anyone that really loves their body might grow up to the point to say, what is it that it takes for my body to be this healthy being and realize that it's not just the things you put into it from the grocery store, because those things couldn't be there without the sun, the moon, the stars, and the whole thing. Yeah. So you go from, you go from a sort of a self care, which is great to realizing that your body can't be any healthier than the world or the environment. And that means you have to be in relationship with the cycles of the moon and the seasons. And then you have to start saying, well, what, what causes all that? We're in a giant living, breathing, emoting. Everything that we do is a product of the universe because it takes the whole universe to make us. So if we're crying, the universe is crying. If we're loving, the universe is loving. If we're being violent, we're probably not paying attention to spirituality. <laughs> <laughs> so well said. Of the books on diet, lifestyle, nutrition, and related issues that you studied, what are the top two to four books you feel everyone should study? Notice I didn't say read, study. And are there any you feel that are particularly important to mothers and or fathers to engage? Mm, I love that last part. And I'll, I'll start there. My sister, uh, in, in my immediate family, I have one older sister. She just had her first baby, so big deal in the family. Mm -hmm. And watching her go through her pregnancy, uh, it was really incredible to um, recognize how important this this time and and now her being a mother going forward is for just her resources and tools to support the health of her child. And so again, unfamiliar to me as a not being a parent yet, but something that um, I really enjoyed as a well recommended book and offered to my sister was Expecting Better by Emily Oster, which oh, was um, just a, a really and and mainly for the purpose of. Um, broadening our perspective on the relatively outdated research around um, uh, pregnancy nutrition. And just to have us, not not even to say like do it different and don't do those things, but just to help expecting parents um, think differently and consider other opportunities or other options with how to take care of our bodies and the things that I think um, culturally we've come to believe is ultimate truth. Just to, to second guess though, is it, you know, kind of did a roundup of a lot of research and a roundup of a lot of the common um, recommendations. And, and I think such an invitation to um, open up conversation with actually our, our, um, our wise parents or grandparents or, you know, family members in our, in our community and also our own families to really inherit some wisdom over and above what maybe the government's had us believe for a long time. So mm. great, great book. Again, I haven't had the opportunity to apply it to my own life yet, but intend to. Uh, and um, and just to anchor on that last one. And then uh, the last kind of point on, on families, uh, mothers and fathers. But um, the the two books that opened my eyes early on when I was in, in nutrition and and uh, again, my background was animal nutrition. So coming into uh, and the kind of the clinical understanding of animal nutrition, coming into uh, human health, uh, two books that I really enjoyed that had me um, better understand the nutrient crisis were were Naked Calories by the the Coltons, and I just love that um, the book um, by Mira and um, gosh uh, Jason Colton. Mm. Um, they're, they're two PhDs, um, and they they really again, do a great summary of the research in soil degradation and, and the concern around, you know, a calorie isn't a calorie, but also like an apple isn't an apple, like what it used to be. And so it's a, a very digestible book. And I think speaks to so much of the perspective that you so eloquently offer in this. And, um, and I easily to recommend is actually your book, Paul. Oh, um, good. Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. How to eat and move and be healthy was a book we were we were, before we were recording today this session. Um, I I definitely think we're, we're sharing it is such a fundamental book in in understanding the 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 key areas of a healthy lifestyle. It helped me you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago now as a trainer, better understand how broad health and wellness was because I was definitely going into it from a certified trainer perspective, which is very much prescriptive. And, and you, I really quickly recognized how limited that ultimately was in, in creating healthy living for my clients. Um, what I came to at least shake out of and, and better understand in the, in the broad sense of what, you know, health with a capital H could look like something much bigger. Um, so that's, a key and easy recommendation as well. Yes. And I would say that if, if I had to recommend what I think to be probably the most important nutrition book in the world to read, especially for parents, it's Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by Weston A. Price. Paul, I've got it right here. It's so funny. I looked at my bookshelf before yeah. this. Uh, before this, uh, there it is. Um, there it is, and that was my my fourth one. I was like, ah, it's it's a pretty heavy book, but I'm sure you've got a great reason for parents to read this. Well, you know, as you can see, he shows the pictures of natives before they made contact with white man's food or processed food, and how it changed their teeth, their bone structures, Everything. their rates of disease, cavities, infections. And, and it happened so quickly within one generation, it caused serious damage to the bodies, which we now know as a genetic insult. Yeah. Right. And back then you're talking, you know, he started doing all, he started doing this research in 1938. So we didn't have 6 billion pounds of pesticides being sprayed on 10 countries. We didn't have any pesticides were a product of the war machine. And how do they use chemicals used to make ammunition to sell to farmers and you know the, the whole there's a whole story behind that that I won't go into, but basically our chemical fertilizers are actually from ammunition factories. So it's really it's Origin. we're supporting the the war industry, the military industrial complex, by poisoning our soils. So the war continues, unfortunately, at their great profit. But the 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 key thing is Weston Price was studying these tribes when there were still tribes all over the world that you could find that hadn't been touched or minimally touched by white man's food or processed food of any kind. But there was people in tribes that Weston Price looked for that went off to go to colleges or got jobs, et cetera. And, and so he was able to actually look at their families, talk to their families, look at their teeth structure, look at their bone structure, look at their history of illness and disease, and then compare it with the one or two children that went off to a university in a major city and were now eating white flour, processed sugar, and pasteurized anything. And I mean, when you think that it's really, it's just what was pasteurized, what was cooked, and what was bleached to turn white, yeah. just, just a few things, and how severely it damaged people's bodies, I think because the pictures are so profound and because it was such pure research and it's just undeniable. I mean, you, you know, you can't argue with it. I mean, I was going to use that word is undeniable. It's a, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got one brother who, and sister who were still in their Swiss village milking cows and making their own cheese. And the one that went to school, uh, has crooked teeth and diseases. And the only difference is they went to cities, right? Yeah. So I think for people that really want to learn the truth of what nutrition is uh, from from the perspective of history and, and the difference between native tribes and people that got exposed to to sort of more of an industrial mindset, it's 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 unbeatable. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm thank you for recommending my my book. I wouldn't have held it against you if you didn't. But <laughs> you know what what my book How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy is is the synthesis of probably about three thousand books and yeah. my entire life's work up to that point. I mean, I be I began my career in uh, January 1984, and I started writing How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy in the year 2000. So I had 16 years of clinical experience by the time I started writing How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. I'm at 39 years in my practice now. Um, but, you know, I've had people like Ben Greenfield and others say to me, you know, one of the most common comments I get about your book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy is it's outdated. 
And I say, oh, is that right? <laughs> I say, if you can find one thing in that book that needs to be updated, show it to me. And so far, nobody's been able to do it. But they, what they do is they think just because it was written in two, or published in 2004 that it's outdated. I got news for you. Scientific research says the human genome only changes about one-tenth of one percent every 100,000 years. Now, I'm not talking about how the human genome reacts to the environment. I'm talking what makes a human genome a human genome. And so uh, you, you, you still got the same teeth, the same body, the same heart, the same liver, the same systems, and the same issues uh, that we have to be concerned about every day uh, that we did when I wrote that book. And it's still about food. It's still about exercise. It's still about movement. It's still about sleep. It's still about the core principles that you have to know, or you're going to end up being one of those people contributing 14,000 or more to the medical system every year. Yeah. It, it's the, the more timeless principles, I think. And I, we've got a, a good number of years before the, any edits are needed, you know, a couple, couple hundred thousand. Oh uh, yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be, I'll be gone. So if I'm gone and it needs an update, could you, could you please take that over for me? And <laughs> you, go, just you, throw it out there. you can say that I give it Organifi permission to uh, update <laughs> and sell my book. Noted. <laughs> yeah. Um, now we've talked about this a lot, but what measures do you take to ensure that your products are pesticide, herbicide, rodenticide, fungicide free. I know you're, you're testing, right? Yes. Yeah. So biggest thing is testing. And as I talked about really focusing on the sourcing, so knowing the farms, uh, being familiar with their practices, a lot of our business, um, operations also fund practices on that farm. So let's say, um, in our Baobab farms, we're helping them, um, create bathrooms and a school system, uh, on their farms. And so trying to be as involved as possible in those communities. A lot of this was learned actually, um, locally, uh, the coffee movement in San Diego really created the, um, farm level connection and farm sourcing and, um, a local coffee roaster, uh, bird rock coffee did an incredible job 10 years ago, even, um, telling the stories of these farms. And I think it's just humanizing where where their product, the coffee beans, comes from, but also the, the actual relationship with the farmers themselves. And I think, unfortunately, so much of that has become marketing today. But I don't know if you can tell, we're not doing a great job marketing the side of the business because it's not marketing to us. It's like our, our quality in, in product and sourcing. Uh, I'm, ho I'm hopeful that we do a better job telling those stories. I think it's very helpful for the consumers, hopefully, to to see that connection and to be part of that. But it's um, key in, in how we practice this at the company is the sourcing and the relationship with the farmers, um, the farms that we source our ingredients from. Then next is the quality standards and the certain the certificates and even the certificate of analysis that also proves those certificates are still valid. So um, as much as, again, lots of marketing is like third party tested, all that stuff, practicing it is key and having those C of A's, the certificates of analysis available when anybody needs it. As you even said years ago, Drew had those. We still do for all of our products uh, and will continue to. It's just the the, the quality checks that are necessary today with a lot of things in change and in flux in the market. So or not in the market, but in our industry and space alone. When, like we were talking about, the incentive is unfortunately um, misaligned with quality a lot of the time. So in order to help our, our the farms that we source from, the certification still be in integrity, we're also doing our part in shoring that up. You know, it's interesting. I'll share with you, you probably don't know this, but of all the companies that have tried to get me involved during my career in selling their whatever it is, juice plus to supplements <laughs> to whatever, many of them claim they were organic. And when I said, show me your organic certifications, nobody would do it. The most common thing I heard was, oh, it's proprietary information. I said, do you realize how stupid what you just said is? And do you Baloney. realize that you're Baloney. not talking to an idiot? Right. So I've never been able to work with anybody. So when Drew immediately got me those 14 certifications, I went, OK, we got a relationship building right here. I can trust this. I mean, I of course, I knew who Drew was and, and, and I, I trusted him to be on the level. But there's no proof like the proof. Right. And I, I have a responsibility to my listeners and to my students not to mislead people. And I'm not here to sell shit. I don't do this for money. I do this because I care about life and I care about people. And yes, I have to make a living just like we all do, but I'm not going to do it by bullshitting people, which brings up an important point. You were talking about marketing. Well, marketing today is really lying very effectively. Yeah. But my definition of marketing, which I don't remember where I got it. I was studying marketing for a number of years, but 
I read a book on marketing and, and the definition that I, it's, that I use with my students is effective marketing is telling the truth attractively. I love that. And that's, that's how I've always marketed the Czech Institute. I don't lie to people. I tell the truth attractively. And that's why I've put case histories in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. These are actually real people. You can call every one of them up. And these cases actually happen. And they're 100% truthful. And, and the reason I put those in there is because those are the kinds of things that happen to people all the time. But most people don't realize that there is natural solutions that don't require surgery, drugs, or trickery. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> so, you know, I think we should all remember that effective marketing is telling the truth attractively, not telling lies to people. Yeah. And as a consumer, you know, if, if I'm looking at trying a new product, one, I normally do that with companies I know or business owners I know, to your point. And and then being able to reach out and, and request C of A's, being able to look into a certification I'm not familiar with. You know, I go do a little homework and it's, again, not not hard. And luckily, there's so much information available. But doing those first steps are really, really key. Um, and and I think there is a lot of simple ways to <laughs> call call BS on a lot of the products out there. And using a good filter on that is is not luckily too tough for consumers, although there's a lot of misinformation. So um, just taking that one step, just like you said, if the companies never respond when you ask for C of A's or ask for the certificates or ask a basic question about the quality, even standards they use, it's a pretty good indication that, you know, they're, they're selling trash. Yep, there's because they can't ask and tell the truth, so it's just better to play dead, I guess. Yeah. Um, if you looked into your crystal ball and became a fortune teller or a psychic for us, how long do you think we have before we create a major crisis if we don't really get all this misuse of chemicals and technology under control? Well, it depends on how you're, you're classifying a crisis. I think we're already in one. A uh, major health crisis yeah. is already happening, right? I think we're, we, we've are we experienced degrees of a food crisis, um, both with supply chain, but also with what's happening with control of food. And, and so I, I think, I think no time at all, we've experienced the start of a, you know, soil crisis. Um, and now I, I think what's, what's interesting is looking at how, what does the path to recovery from, from these spaces look like? And, um, you know, I, maybe it's like, <laughs> you know, within a decade or so, I think everyone will feel a version of, of these, these areas in health being in crisis. Um, but I, I certainly don't believe we can contain, continue to produce our food in the way that we are. Um, I see the, the, the light spots being in small organic farms, many more people turning to wanting to understand farming and, and get involved in it. A generation of, um, of farmers actually joining that, that, um, industry first generation farmers, which hasn't happened in, you know, how long. Uh, and I think it's small, but those are the things that I, I think will help and be important. Yes. Well, I think you're right. The, the crisis is already here, but if we're not careful, it's going to get a lot worse. And really quick, this is a great question. I, I think looking at what's normal today, we had an internal discussion and we were talking about just showcasing you know, how we know that there's a problem is our definition of normal is taking sleeping pills to sleep, taking yeah. laxatives to go to the bathroom. Taking Take, Viagra for when you're 19. Yeah, taking Viagra when you're 19. Um, you know, taking um, supplemental hormones at all different stages of both men and women's lives as normal. Um, you know, or taking antacids to not have indigestion. Like that is the normal. So the normal is so far from natural. Um, this is this is the crisis, right? And um, and I think it's a clear representation of of the work to be done or the progress that needs to get made. And, and ideally returning back to natural is such a, um, <laughs> a need right now. Yeah. And here's the sad part of it. The normal you've just described equals highly profitable for the very corporations that have done this to the planet. And, 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 you know, the only way out of that Mexican finger trap is People have to start taking responsibility for their own health, well-being, and sovereignty and quit turning over their lack of self-management and self-awareness to doctors as problems that aren't really problems because the body's done something wrong. 
They're the side effects of a lack of commitment and love of and care for oneself and paying attention. I mean, I tell my students and my patients, look, it takes 10 years to become an obese person and you got to work at it. Yeah. Every day you get naked and you look in the mirror. So how far down the road do you go before you say, wait a minute, these pills aren't working, this diet isn't working, my exercise program or lack thereof isn't working? That's just simply a lack of participation. And if you go back to our analogy of raising a plant and how you got to water it and care for it or care for your pets, if, if your body was a plant, it would have been dead a long time ago. And if it was an animal, it would have been dead a long time ago. And it's just the miracle of the human body that it has that many... Um, redundancies and backup systems that that it's it's a testament to the incredible design but i think it's time for people to to start growing up and quit using doctors and therapists as their mommy and their daddy and start becoming their own parent and their own gardener and stop watching junk television and start reading books like nutrition and physical degeneration and and the kinds of things we've just been talking about or, you know, quite frankly, your future is the shits. <laughs> it's really the shits. You're going to, there's no need to worry about the Christian hell. You're already in hell. You've created it yourself. You're walking around in it. I mean, I look at the health of people's bodies. and I mean, I, I, I personally, if I can't poop for a day, I feel like shit. I can feel it like my body's getting poisoned. If I don't exercise regularly, I'm like, I am sensitive enough to the, truth of my body's needs and its communications to look at a lot of these people i'm like oh my freaking god i would rather die than be trapped in that body <laughs> you know i really would i would say fuck just shoot me man yeah and it's 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 the wake up call of asking the question is this working for me and yeah. and i i think you know developing this the self awareness to ask that question and then the intuitive connection with your body, right? The actual um, proprioceptive connection with your body to understand if it's working or not. Um, and, and even hear the signs. I think, um, you know, similar to my story 10 years ago, living a very healthy lifestyle, you could say, doing all the right things on paper, you could say, and then really getting the um, abrupt awakening that I was not taking care of my health. And so I still, you know, like what, what you're saying is right, Paul. And I think there's, there's such a... Um, for me, this spot in um, in continuing to develop self awareness and 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 being able to tune in to what my body is telling me, and I, I'm I'm consistently getting the reminder that there's more work to be done. Two years ago, I I lost some sight actually in my left eye. I had um, such high stress levels that uh, I actually had fluid over my macroma. It happens um, occasionally with just high cortisol levels. And it was such a, I, I, again, wake up call. It was an indication uh, I wasn't maintaining my physical health. So I wasn't exercising as much as I typically would and giving my, myself a break from work. I had taken on too much and I wasn't yeah. asking for help. I wasn't communicating uh, what I needed. And so, you know, even, and I just want to offer this as like, uh, even for folks like you and me, um, and especially I'm speaking from my own experience, I still get very humbled and the reminder that, I get to continue to tune and hone my my understanding of my body language, and at each definitely at each decade for me, or at each um, different stage in my life, that's going to look different. And so, so much of my focus is um, being able to have grace and um, care and patience with myself, which I did not have ten years ago. I you know still working on, but it is the humbling experience that there's so much yet to understand about how to take good care of my body and the best care of my body I can. Yeah, that's, you know, we all learn. Uh, most of my learning came from just real bad injuries in athletics, just pushing sure. myself to extremes, racing motorcycles and boxing and kickboxing and cliff diving. And, you know, I'm, I'm riddled with broken bones and I've had many, many bad concussions and I, I mean, if someone took an x-ray of my body, they'd think I got ran over by a train or something, <laughs> but it taught me so much, you know, and there was not much doctors. They would always just say the same thing. You know, you got to stop racing motorcycles and you need to stop boxing. And I'm like, uh, that's not why I'm here. <laughs> I'm here because I want to keep doing it. Yeah. 
and so I, I just really had to spend a lot of time with my body and, and it, it guided me, you know, it's just like, I, it became my teacher and I've always been a high level athlete. So I would always be able to tell, like, if I change my diet, I could tell by how fast I could run or not run. I could tell by how much I could lift or not lift or, you know, how winded I got, you know, you, once you develop an intimate relationship with your body, you can go back to the same tasks, exercise or fitness tests. And you can see, okay, well, the only thing that's changed is I've added this supplement or I've not been getting enough sleep or whatever. Yeah. So I, I, I think, you know, if people just started having a more conscious relationship with their body and realized it's 4.9 billion years of evolution they're walking around in and stop listening to doctors that think they're smart when they aren't very smart at all. I tell people all the time, the worst thing you can do is go to a sick doctor for health advice. <laughs> you know, there's an old saying, dead doctors don't lie. And the average, the average physician lives 10 years less than the average human being. So wow. um, they could say, oh, our job's too stressful. I said, well, it's not as stressful as being a, 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 a um, air traffic controller. It's not as stressful as being a soldier uh, on the uh, battlefield or even in a military unit like I was in the 82nd where you're always under alert all the time and under high stress. Um, you know, point is we have to start taking responsibility for our relationship and not renting it out, which, yeah. which is a point I would like to share just for you and the listeners. You're, you're hip to all this, but in my holistic lifestyle coach training program through the Czech Academy, I educate the students. You never want to use the word treatment with any of your clients. Mm. And I, and here's what I say to them. And I'll ask you, I say, may, if I say I'm treating you to dinner tonight, who's paying? <laughs> you are. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So when you go to a doctor or a therapist for treatment, based on the meanings of the words we're using, we think we're going to go there and pay them 75, 100 or whatever dollars. And they're going to treat us by getting rid of our problems. And we're going to go back home and keep being the same village idiot we were yesterday. Yeah. So it works, I, it works on us. It is. So I say to my client, my students, I say, we don't treat people that have acquired diseases. We don't, we don't treat, treat people that have diseases. We coach people. Yeah. So they don't have diseases. So we don't, try to treat the symptoms, we coach them so that they don't keep creating the environment that leads to the pathology. So powerful. Yeah, it's just, it's important because it's a very important mindset that our culture has gotten trapped into. And the whole medical model is a treatment model, but we need a coaching model because treatment's not based on education, it's prescriptive. Yeah. But the, the, what I teach people is really outline and how to eat, move and be healthy. But I, I say, these are the things you have got to manage, and these are the things you got to be aware of, or you're probably going to end up sick and diseased and profitable. And as I say to my students, you will buy a surgeon a new Porsche, but you're not going to get to choose the color. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, very true. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the show. I imagine you know that magnesium is one of the minerals that people in North America are the most efficient in, but it's an extremely important mineral to have in your diet regularly. And believe it or not, Bioptimizers has improved what was already well known to be the best magnesium formula out there called Magnesium Breakthrough. So I've got Wade Lightheart with me to explain what it is they've done to improve this already excellent formula. Wade, what is new about your new Mag Breakthrough formula? Well, it's called sucrosomial magnesium. So we have seven different types of magnesium in Magnesium Breakthrough because they're uptaken by different parts of the body. But a new type of magnesium has been created called sucrosomial. And what it shows in the research and science is that it's actually even more absorbable by the body, particularly inside of the brain, which is a big aspect uh, to enhance neurotransmitter formation, as well as ensuring the rest and relax response in the nervous system that a lot of people will take magnesium for. They find it, you know, clocks them down, helps them sleep better, allows for the relaxation of striated and smooth muscle tissue in the body, which creates an energetic relief. And so when we added sucrosomial, we were able to demonstrate inside our lab facility that we were able to get better improvements. Of course, we have a partnership with the Birch International University. We have some patents we're working on, uh, which will 
kind of relay some of these things, but sucrosomial was a no brainer when we added to the formula, improved the results or improved the uptake and the reports back from our testing team were like, wow, this, we get more results with less caps. And that's always the goal for our company. That's excellent. I love it. I, I always say, and people have probably heard me say it before. I just am so amazed how you guys are constantly and always improving and working your best to not only make better products for us, but it doesn't seem to me that it gets more expensive as you make them better. So that's a real gift to the world. Thank you. Where can people get their new magnesium breakthrough formula? All you need to do is go to www.magbreakthrough.com slash living4d. Put in Paul 10, get 10% discount on your first bottle. And of course, if you order multiple bottles, you can get an extensive discount on that as well. And like everything else we sell, 365 day money back guarantee. If this isn't the best magnesium you've ever taken in your life, we demand that you tell us and we can give you your money back. But I think you're probably going to demand, hey, can I get more of this? <laughs> that, that's probably more the truth. So that's mag, M-A-G, breakthrough.com forward slash living number four, and then the letter D, code Paul 10. Enjoy deeper relaxation and better nutrition with Mag Breakthrough. Many people are aware of what adaptogens are and how they can be beneficial to lowering stress and ultimately can help people avoid challenges like adrenal exhaustion, chronic fatigue, poor sleep quality and recovery, chronic inflammation, and more. Um, could you give us more about what adaptogens are, how they can uh, be best used, and which of your products offer adaptogenic support and share anything else that you think people should know about adaptogens? Yeah, yeah. You can think of adaptogens as like a special category of um, plants and herbs and roots. And essentially, they are those that specifically act on the body or act with the body to modulate our stress response. And, you know, inherent in the name, they're adapting based on our natural homeostasis, um, our natural state of homeostasis that we're, our current body is in. So in other words, just as your example earlier, Paul, if, if you're giving me ashwagandha and we're both taking it that ashwagandha will support our body in probably significantly different ways uh, because it is addressing and adapting with our level of cortisol and our stress hormones. All of those, what I love learning in, um, in college, and I, I consistently go back to this, is the understanding that our bodies are just feedback loops. Mm -hmm. You know, so much of our endocrinology, um, our hormone cascades, our neurobiology, all of this is cascades in the body and feedback loops. So as we're able to support the balancing right? Uh, our adaptive stress response, especially across all ages. And as we age as human beings, our adaptive stress response grows. <laughs> and so adaptogens become more and more important as we age. And to your point, even as we are including superfoods and adaptogens in, in ideally the diets and lifestyles of kids, even better. But our need for them, our, our, say, our, our benefit um, in, in incorporating them grows as we age. Our bodies need a little bit more support in in being adaptable and being able to handle the degrees of stress that are inherent in our life cycles. So what's really interesting is um, adaptogens most commonly, you know, you're talking about ashwagandha, rhodiola, mm -hmm. um, reishi, lots of mushrooms today, like very, very popular mushrooms, um, which we really enjoy uh, incorporating in our products. But nearly all of our products include adaptogens. Um, very few, our protein is one that mainly has um, food-based vitamins in there, and there isn't a key adaptogen. Every other product focuses on a key adaptogen that supports the inherent benefit and of the product itself. For instance, um, some key call outs would be like gold has um, reishi, which is an incredible mushroom for grounding and balancing, uh, balancing sleep cycles and energy, decreasing stress and immunity. Green, our like highlight product, our hero product, the really superpower um, adaptogen is ashwagandha in there. And so, you know, really popularized um, in the last couple of years, or I'll say repopularized, but ancient um, uh, cultures use this for, for um, really, really uh, the key benefit of reducing stress and, and balancing basically um, the thyroid. Uh, and we see that as showing up as weight management and balancing cortisol in the body, balancing sleep cycles today and immune system as well. Um, and so each of our, our key products has at least one really strong adaptogen to support the benefit. Red being a, a key product that has multiple cordyceps, reishi, rhodiola, and um, uh, just a really strong blend of the accompanying products. So our ingredients in there. 
the actual Webster dictionary definition, which is like a, a, a non-toxic substance and especially a plant extract that is held to increase the body's ability to resist the damaging effects of stress and promote or restore normal physiological functioning. So it's like just a really, really supportive um, ingredient with some incredible superpowers to help our health and vitality. Great. When I was reading your uh, the information about you, um, just sort of getting more background on you, you you talked about something I hadn't heard of, which is infobesity as an epidemic around adaptogens and superfoods. I, I would love to uh, have you explain what that is because I have uh, I've never heard the term. Maybe I'm just getting old and I'm too out of the loop. <laughs> I, I very much doubt that. <laughs> But uh, yeah, using the term to describe just um, the high saturation of information related to specific adaptogens and superfoods, like highly marketed as, as we were talking about. So much of it is marketing t terms, you know, it's on social, it's on um, lots of blogs that, again, don't have actual research citations, are just repeated shared information. So there's this oversaturation, that's like overpopularization. Of Chinese whispers. <laughs> exactly. yeah. You know what that is, right? You, you know that what, how you say something in one person's ear and by the time it goes around the classroom, it's completely different. Yes. Yes. And <laughs> that's what's happening with all sorts of stuff out there. And there's this this understanding that, oh, turmeric's good for me, right? Like that's the base level. You hear lots of information about adaptogens, again, an oversaturation of communicating that this thing is good for you. Mm -hmm. And and the problem is it doesn't it doesn't come with the context, which is like, here's why it's good for you. Here's why you should use it or when and and how. And even even the perspective on dosing. So with you know honoring the actual ingredient, it's not just any turmeric. You know, it's, it's not just any ashwagandha. It's it's uh, looking also at understanding how it interacts with the body and which form is actually most beneficial and, um, you know, looking a couple layers deeper. So there's this large amount of over-information, over-saturation of communicating adaptogens and superfoods are good for people without the context of how to integrate them, how to feel the benefit, and how to really use them in our lifestyles. Yeah. You know, a good example uh, that I can share in that regard is tobacco has a very bad reputation, but it's got a reputation based on commercially grown toxic tobacco that's been sprayed with chemicals and, and all sorts of crap. So people think all tobacco is bad, but I've got a couple of books, one written by a medical doctor on the healing benefits of tobacco. The difference is it's not garbage. It's organically grown. We grow our own tobacco here. I love, that's what I've been vaporizing tobacco and herbs, but I don't use tobaccos that have been sprayed with chemicals. And I use tobaccos that are great grown on good soil. And so when people see me vaporizing tobacco, they often get completely freaked out. Like here it is. Here it is. Cheers to that. I'm magic. Cheers. It just appears out of the air. That's my love of the tobacco spirit. Of course, it has something to do with my wife. Thank you, Faye. When you actually experience real tobacco you could never touch commercial tobacco yeah point being is if you just go out and start looking at websites about tobacco you could get the very wrong impression but if you do some research and you actually take it into your own responsibility to say what's the truth about this you can find something radically different yeah and, and yeah go ahead oh, no please didn't mean to interrupt no, no, I, 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 I was just sort of acknowledging <laughs> you and saying, yes, we agree, you know? Yes, yes. And I think with that, it's, it's looking at there isn't inherently anything from nature that I believe is good or bad. It's just the, the integration to an individual's lifestyle and, and even recognizing the, you know, dose benefit and the um, dose response is so critical in that if we're, anything really good for us, even air and water, right? We can actually overdo those things. There's oh, yeah. Actually, I don't know if you know, but a Marine died in Camp Pendleton a couple of years ago because the drill sergeants made him so much drink so much water, he drowned in himself. Hi hi hypernaturia, right? I think that's what it's called. Yeah, yeah. hypernaturia. And it's just a reminder that without context, without guidance, I'll say, I think guidance and coaching, right, is one of the key ingredients missing in our supplement and food industry today, even more so needed. Um, we, we, don't, we don't properly map that dose benefit curve. And there's a, there's a really um, a high likelihood that, you know, you're taking turmeric because you heard it was good for you, but 
you're also not taking the right um, extraction. You're not taking maybe the the, the format that's going to be best for you based on what you need. And so when we talk about, you know, it, in obesity is just an overloading amount of unhealthy information. Right. And um, even the highest quality, purest turmeric or ashwagandha or anything can become a poison if you eat too much of it. Vitamin D. Yeah, anything. I mean, literally anything. And by, you know, the definition of a drug is anything that modulates the function of a cell. Well, everything you eat and drink is modulating the function of a cell. <laughs> so true. You know, and, and I tell my students, because obviously we have to deal with tons of people with shitloads of medical problems and piles of drugs and pills from doctors. But, but, but I make a statement to my students that I think is very important. And, and, and that is this two statements. I say there's the natural approach and there's the drug approach. The natural approach is for people that are willing to actually be involved in their life. And the drugs are for people that don't want to participate in their life. And they just want a quick fix. Yeah. And I say, there's no such thing as a bad drug, only an incorrectly prescribed drug. Now, of course there are bad drugs. Fauci's the one that is guaranteeing that we know about that. But the point I'm making is if you prescribe the wrong drug, it can kill somebody. But if you prescribe the right drug, it can really help somebody. And isn't it interesting that medical doctors, based on their own journals, kill more people than almost every disease, except maybe the top two diseases from malprescribed drugs and surgical blunders? So, my philosophy is. If you want to go the drug route, hey, that's cool. You're a human being. You got free will. You got choice. You got to take responsibility for your choices. And if it works, great. If it doesn't work, maybe you'll try another alternative. But if you keep doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result, then you know you need to go see a psychologist. <laughs> and um, the other thing that's se se severely missing, and I think you'll agree with this, is common sense. People have really lost common sense. It's like are you paying attention to how long you've been using this or that drug or supplement, whether or not it's working? And if it's not, why do you keep doing it um, yeah. and spending a lot of money doing that? I mean, you would not believe the professional athletes that come to me. I've had athletes that bring an entire, not a gym bag, but like a duffel bag of the supplements that they're taking every day. Some of these things, guys are spending 2000 2500 bucks a month on supplements. And they're coming to me because they're all messed up and sick and nothing's working. The first thing I do is I say, I want you to take seven days off, no supplements, no medical drugs. If I have to call the doctors to get approval, I'll do it. And every single one in my entire career came back to me and said, Paul, I am feeling so damn much better. I don't know why the hell I was spending all this money on this stuff. Yeah. And I say, you know what? Because you read too many magazines and you read the, look at the internet too much. It's, uh, I guess two, two questions is, uh, is this working for me? Um, and is this for me? <laughs> and is it really true? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really true. I mean, today I, I think there's a problem with supplement cabinets, right? They're very full. And to your point, there's majority of folks are unclear what's actually working for them and why. And so it's very hard to stop taking supplements with clarity and start taking supplements with clarity. I think both decisions are done with lacking clarity, either it's a financial decision or it's a, you know, a, uh, impromptu or, um, you know, random purchase and then they keep taking it. So, you know, that's again, one of the reasons we talked about before, but why we use clinically proven ingredients and the standardization that has the impact. And then also educate on the fact that adaptogens and real foods may take 30 days to feel the benefit of. Yes. But you, know, you have to have that awareness different from stimulants and drugs like you're talking about. This whole foods approach may take 30, 60, 90 days, but it's the the intentionality and understanding of what you're looking for. It's likely not the immediate resolution of maybe like what, what um, Excedrin would do for a headache, but what right. if we resolve the root of why you're getting a headache in the first place? Yes. And it's interesting because I've done some research on teas and I did a great podcast called The Ooh. History of Teas with Simon Cheng, which was very good. If you're interested in teas, it's a really good podcast. Um, but I looked into, for example, Moringa, you know, Tulsi Moringa tea. And what I found when I started looking into teas, especially when I found literature in traditional Chinese medicine about these herbs, 
almost consistently, they said, to get the benefits of this tea, you need to drink it for several months on a daily basis. It's not a quick fix. And I actually start my day every day with Tulsi Moringa tea and I, I, my body loves it. And I always let my soul guide me. I look at all my selection and I just say to my body, which tea do you want today? And, and, and I just relax and, and my eyes go to the box that it wants. And so every morning it chooses Tulsi Moringa. So it must want Moringa. Now there could come a day where it changes. And if it does, I do, but most consistently it wants Moringa, which has a real vitalizing effect on the body. But the key point is it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, not a short term investment. Some of these things have to have time. The same is true of acupuncture. People think they're going to go to an acupuncture and have one session and get and, and be magically healed. But acupuncture builds from therapy session to therapy session. So the effects of it start to grow. It's not just a one stop fix. So we've kind of got to grow up and get out of this instant gratification mentality with health because it doesn't work. And <laughs> I love this. Uh, <laughs> and moringa is such a, a powerful, powerful ingredient to incorporate or food to incorporate in your lifestyle. It's so cool. You'd take that tea every morning. Uh, one of the reasons why we added it to, to our green juice is because we loved trying to incorporate that normally outside of tea and it's tough. So that's beautiful. And I was, I was laughing because I was just remembering an analogy in that um, one bowl of salad, the act of eating a bowl of salad will not radically change your health. So the same way we think about just food in general being something that <laughs> our our perception of exercise, doing one bicep curl will not change well, your arm. No, <laughs> the idea of, of eating one salad will not change your state of nutrition and your nutritional right. balance. And so we really get to apply that same mentality. It serves, I think, very well as you look at supplementation when we're talking about whole foods and superfoods and adaptogens, different from beneficially so different from stimulants and different from some of the you know more aggressive nootropics and so i think very helpfully in and why we even have half our products in 30 day servings is because we're not saying take it once and change your life we're saying hey learn to enjoy this daily like this can be a really convenient part of your lifestyle and and importantly so rather than you're going to take it a couple of days and forget about it that's one of the things i love about your products because they do have a lot of the ingredients that are important daily components. That's yeah. why we, we love giving our kids, you know, all the Organifi drinks and products because one, they love them. And two, the buildup effect of that is, is long-term and, and they're kids. So they've got to learn these habits early or they get tricked by all the, the BS out there. One of the things that came to my mind, I wanted to share with you, that's quite interesting because you triggered this with the mention of salad. I'm a member of the British Soil Association. They have a quite a comprehensive library, of very interesting research. One research study that popped into my head that I'll tell you about real quick is, you know, there's, there was, there's a lot of research papers out there that have compared organic to non-organic and found that it was no more nutritious. And when I saw these papers, I'm like, this is absolute horseshit. And so I looked into this and I found out that the way this, these studies are being done is company you might not know this, but this is pretty shocking. Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Mars Bar, Hershey's, Cadbury, Nestle, they all own organic certifications, right? So what they do is they create these shell companies under different names. They grow the food the same way they grow everything else. There's no real organic certification. And then they send their food to the universities that they fund the agricultural department. And they say, compare this to this. And then they write these studies as scientific studies, but nobody actually does the work to follow the money, see who owns these companies and how these foods are being farmed, which I did. And so the British Soil Association took 128 studies comparing commercial to organic food. They put a panel of scientists together. They analyzed the scientific studies. They found of 128 studies, only 28 of them were scientifically valid based on study design, and all 28 of them showed significantly increased benefits and nutrition density in organic foods. Wow. So if you don't do your own research and you don't look for people that are really doing real research, not bogus propaganda, but, you can get tricked. All but. And when I was doing my research to write how to eat, move, and be healthy, I came across a study in the British Soil Association that I believe was published in the year 2000. And it was, this goes to your salad comment. They had the historical records of nutritional analysis of different plant crops for a long, long time, probably going all the way back into the 30s. And they analyzed, 
a head of lettuce, a standard commercial head of lettuce from the store, and did a nutrient analysis on it, and they showed that you would have to eat 50 heads of lettuce of commercially grown, uh, commercially grown lettuce in the year 2000 to get the same nutrient benefits as one head of lettuce 50 years previously. Isn't that crazy? Yes. I mean, and that, that alone is a reason to supplement with supplemental whole foods. If you're having a hard time prioritizing buying organic or finding or sourcing organic or quality you can trust, but yes. that's alarming. It, it's true. And, and so what we've got is empty food that looks like lettuce and looks like carrots and looks like tomatoes, but it's nothing. And, and you know, NPK fertilizers are salts. So what happens is the plants are being watered with salt water, which causes them to suck up huge amounts of water to try to stay alive. One of the tricks is that those fertilizers increase the color in the plants quite often. Vibrancy, right? But what you get is a, is an empty thing. And that's why so many children don't want to eat vegetables because they, they don't taste anything in them. But when you yeah. give them certified organic vegetables, they're all of a sudden like, wow, this actually has taste to it. You know, go pick fresh strawberries, go, you know, pick fresh carrots from a garden. And I mean, I'd be shocked if a kid didn't absolutely love that. <laughs> it was a f funny thing. I've mentioned this on a podcast before, but I'll share it again. I think it was my son's fourth or fourth birthday. We had a birthday party for him and invited 16 of his friends from school and, you know, people that wanted to come to his party that we knew. And we brought certified organic everything, of course. And we had salads and we had vegetables and we had a, a lot of nice stuff, you know. And I'm standing there looking at all these kids eating. And the only kid in the room that was eating vegetables was my son. And one of the mothers spontaneously walked up to me and said, do you notice that your child is the only one eating any vegetables in this room? I said, that's because he's been raised on organic vegetables and he likes them. And he actually craves them. My kids will, my kids go out in our garden and pick peas and tomatoes and they're eating the stuff all the time. And you don't have to ask them to do it. You, in fact, they will raid the strawberry plants. They will, they will raid the tomato plants and they're walking around with pockets of tomatoes, popping them in their mouth all day long. But my, I, I share that because people don't realize that most kids don't like vegetables because their bodies are telling them not to eat them. You know, they're poisonous, dead things. And one of the things you may or may not remember from my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, is I showed, John Berardi's research showed, it takes 55% of the calories we eat to run food from mouth to anus. Yeah. Just, just to run it through the system before any of that nutrition or energy can be used by your body to think, to create, to dance, sing, go to work. So if you're eating food that doesn't deliver the nutrition that it costs to run a food from their mouth to the toilet, it means every meal you eat, you're depleting your own body just to provide the resources to run it through the digestive process. That's a death sentence. It's a, a lot of uh, wasted space on plates. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a waste of a plate. Yes. <laughs> And I, I have such fond memories growing up raiding the, the, all the berry patches, of course. You had raspberries and, and blueberries and boysenberries, but the snap peas are like one of my favorites. The grapes when they came into season, you know, my parents could me, couldn't keep me out of the garden because of that. And, you know, I think, again, there's so much in training our taste buds that if we, as we grow up eating a lot of chemical laden food and or high salt, high fat, high sugar foods, you know, maybe those taste buds have adapted. And even as adults, it takes a moment to adapt back and change our taste buds. They turn over how quickly, right? They turn over very quickly, thank God. But to readapt to our regular taste buds to actually yes. enjoy healthy food. And so again, one of the reasons why I take time to make really delicious tasting adaptogen rich and superfood products is because they have to taste good. It has mm -hmm. to be inviting. If they're not, it's twice as hard or nine times as hard. <laughs> Actually, yes. And, and train your taste buds. <laughs> exactly. And Rudolf Steiner speaks of what he calls super saturation. And what he shows is that the more you concentrate any chemical or food yeah. to increase the intensity of the flavor, the more the cells adapt to expecting that level of stimulus. And so all of a sudden you take a kid who's been drinking soda pop and eating processed garbage. And you give them real food and they don't taste anything. 
but it's actually a physiological issue. Just like if you're used to drinking three cups of coffee a day and all of a sudden you say, I'm going to stop drinking coffee, you're going to have a headache and feel like shit. Yes. Because you've overstimulated the system. The adrenal glands are exhausted. The cells are overstimulated. So you have to give the body time for its rhythms to reset. Its biorhythms have to reset, which goes all the way to cellular rhythms. So people don't realize that there is an adaptation period. But I, I've been forever teaching people, look, if you want to make uh, your now certified organic um, oatmeal taste better, don't use sugar. Take some prunes and throw prunes yeah. in there or mash the prunes berries. up or berries, pro Poor, poor, or even dates, you can just take yeah. dates and put them in hot water and you'll have amazingly healthy stuff. You don't have to poison yourself just because everybody else is. Yeah. It's such a great transition too, as you're using whole food sources of sweeteners rather than processed white sugar or God knows what to sweeten it, right? Yes. Hello, everybody. I'm sure you're all aware of the importance of heart health and the challenges that people are having with their hearts worldwide due to what's been going on in the world in the last three years. Well, Symbiotica's brand new product, Heart Health, may be just the solution we need. Heart Health is something that we all need and may be one of the most important supplements that anyone that's been vaccinated in the past three years can take. Heart health improves cardiovascular health, balances cholesterol levels over time, supports circulation, and healthy aging. Symbiotica's heart health also aids the digestive system, improves liver function, and reduces risk of heart attack. Symbiotica's new heart health formula is enhanced with CoQ10, a powerful antioxidant that may reduce the negative effects of oxidative stress. If you want to support your heart now, Symbiotica's heart health is a great idea. To get your heart health, go to bit.ly, that's bit.ly, forward slash C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A-L-4-D. That's bit.ly, L-Y, forward slash symbiotica, L-4-D. It's not case sensitive. To get your Living 4D discount of 15%, use the promo code capital L, capital 4, capital D, 15 on checkout. Once again, that's bit.ly forward slash symbiotica L4D. 15% off by using the code capital L, number 4, capital D, 15 on checkout. Enjoy heart health with Symbiotica. A question I wanted to ask you is, what are some of the biggest challenges Organifi has faced or does face with such issues as regulation, overregulation, pressure from regulation agencies, and other challenges? And how have you overcome them to be able to become such a large-scale, successful business? And one of the, to preface the, the, your answer, I, I recently did a podcast with um, Selena Delonguer from Selena Naturally, which her parents founded the Grain and Salt Society, and she was telling about how heavy the regulation and all the tr torture she's had to go through and huge legal fee fees. For example, uh, I can't remember what the word it was. I think maybe it might have been natural or something, but there was a word she used on her package about salt. And then all of a sudden, the uh, lawyers started coming down on her from the food industry saying, you can't say that. But she wasn't saying anything that wasn't true about her salt. And interestingly, they can say that on all their processed crap, but then Selena tries to say something about her high quality, clean, highly tested sea salt, and she has to spend, you know, probably 50 or more thousand dollars on lawyers and ultimately couldn't put the word on the package. So with the amount of uh, product you guys are producing and the quality standards you're trying to take, what, how are you dealing with the regulators and what kind of challenges is that causing for you guys? It's true what, what you know she communicated. There's huge limitations in what we're able to communicate on our labels and in our marketing. So that's a giant challenge and specifically an obstacle to educating our consumers. Now that we actually have a product that we sell, we're in a very different regulated industry. Definitely at... <laughs> at the likelihood of, of being sued by big corporations, by anyone who doesn't want us to market the way that we are and speak the way that we are about food. So high risk and different from, very different from where we came from when we were just educating. So had a lot lower risk profile then. So the obstacles we're, we're dealing with today are, are very similar. Um, we have a lot of 
really tight regulatory checklist we have to go through for our labels. Um, we've invested a, a lot up front in substantiation and research that has us legal proof, lawsuit equipped, you could say. Yes. The likelihood of being sued, we've been in multiple lawsuits for our our claims and marketing. And, and it's been a, a really challenging space to <laughs> go up against uh, folks, a lot of money, you know, a lot of in- in- intention to not have us market the way that we are and not have us produce a product the way that we do. So it comes because with a pretty high Because they don't want competition. A hundred percent. And yeah, funded businesses that are, you know, even even competition going after us. So there's there's definitely a lot of risk um, and it requires us to move a lot slower than we'd prefer in producing new products, bringing things to the market. But, you know, a, a lot of that is addressed with operations and process internally. And we do have great partners in supply chain, in legal, in substantiation or research that we since 2019 have have really heavily partnered with. And, you know, we we had a, I think, a head start in beginning with a certification such as USDA Organic and being third party tested where many companies were not, even though maybe they were doing all the right things and sourcing well. So they had to either go through the legal repercussions of that and or, you know, if they were calling out things on the label, experience that in like a lawsuit where we haven't had to yet. So, right. you know, I have a lot of gratitude for that. I think there's also the the obstacle of censorship uh, in our communication and our accounts. You know, we haven't had our Facebook account since 2019 and able to market on that. It was shut down. And so we, and we don't foresee a way back on there. So I think some of the key obstacles are really being able to get our message out into the world and, you know, Control and marketing, control and communications, and and really how we educate our consumers is my main concern. I just got inspired by you for a new name for Facebook. What's that? Face crook. <laughs> I think pretty pretty accurate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's pretty incredible, and I mean, you know, running a business and growing a business um, through these really interesting times in an area that you know I, I only foresee being more controlled and and higher forms of regulation coming in is is totally concerning, and I I think it's something that we get to continuously adapt in. You know, we we went through supply chain concerns through COVID, of course, and just mm. limitations in in a lot of that area, even sourcing pea protein that's not China-based. You know, there's a lot mm. of limitation on where we can source ingredients from, which is highly concerning. And, you know, for our quality standards, I see that continuing to be an obstacle and one that as we overcome, hopefully continues to build more value for our consumers. It's the work that we do and it takes us a lot of time. <laughs> You know, the Organifi farms are getting closer and closer. They really are, Paul. And I'm getting more excited about that too. I can feel it. I can see it in my third eye. I see the fields. I see the crops. I even see you walking out there showing people what you're doing. I, I believe in that. We, you know, we wanted to partner with a local uh, Coastal Roots farm here in San Diego, which is a tremendous operation in Encinitas and just bringing people closer to food. And so there's a, you know, outside of an operational need, there's a um, a purpose and mission behind doing, whether it is large partnerships and or our, our own farm in participating in that space to deliver value and connection to folks and their food. So yes, you're right. <laughs> May, I, I'm going to ask you something that's not in our plan today, but it must be, it must be a bit stressful for you to handle all this. You're the CEO of a very large, very well-known corporation that's really going, going beyond the norms of food and doing very cutting edge things and having to deal with a lot of regulators and a lot of competition and you know, all the crap that goes with that. Are, are you, you know, what, how, how do you manage your stress? I mean, that's a pretty intense position you're in there. You're piloting a very big ship. It's like you're flying a jumbo jet with millions of people on it. <laughs> well, there's a key, thank you, Paul. There's a key part of this where I started, you know, being on this jumbo jet when it was a small, small, maybe like a, a kite. so there's a little bit of like frog in hot water syndrome where um i don't quite see the the jump because i've been been was employee number one been here for 10 years so there's some of that i think misconception of how big this is that i get to do and then the example that i gave two years ago losing sight in my left eye certainly experiencing a nice amount of uh, a hefty amount of stress that i've 
really been refocusing on balancing. And I can I can tell you today, my my eye is perfect. I, the the fluid has been resolved, and I'm in a great spot. But it's taken some really consistent adaptation or adaptation to how I manage my lifestyle and and stress level. And when I became CEO at I mean, my third year of this seat, prior I was COO. And before that, um, a retention director. And so I've been in a lot of different seats. This one has a, a special amount of stress that comes with it. Um, and mainly it's just the held responsibility for the team, most importantly, the mission yeah. and our you know customers and what we're here to do and grateful for that. And this these last two years, I've, I've rediscovered a form of fitness that brings me a ton of joy and happiness. So I get to play a lot of pickleball, which is oh, like- Oh yeah, I saw favorite. that in your, in your bio there. That's cool. <laughs> It's my favorite thing and really, um, really rediscovering what a new normal is for me and incorporating that in my lifestyle. My husband and I play a ton. So like really uh, an important amount, a dosing of, of fun in my weeks. Uh, I'll play in the morning before work. I'll play after work, you name it. But like it is integrated into my lifestyle. And then the um, the close proximity to my family. So my sister lives about 15, 20 minutes away and I intentionally spend time with her and my nephew and uh, her husband. I, I see them at least twice, three times a week. Steve and I are over there for Sunday night's family dinner. Um, and my parents come and visit really frequently. My mom is visiting actually uh, now. It's her, it was her birthday over the weekend. Oh, happy birthday, mom. Yeah, thank you. I'll tell her. Um, we're playing some pickleball hopefully later. <laughs> tell, her, tell her she gets how to eat, move, and be healthy for her birthday. I will. She will love that, by the way. But all, all this to be said, and kind of my, my point being that it's taken a um, a remembering and a recalibrating what my um, my healthy lifestyle looks like today because my lifestyle has changed due to this increasing stress. So I much more intentionally look at how I'm dosing superfoods and adaptogens, and I much more intensely um, and intentionally look at my uh, journaling practice, my meditation practice, and my sleep practice. And so. Yeah. And I, I don't think I have it solved. You know, again, it was a wake up call two years ago to think I was, I was in a good spot and then get that very like clear, uh, rude awakening, that, uh, loud voice of my body saying that I wasn't in balance, even though I thought mm. I was. And so just the reminder to tune in. Um, and so those are some of the things that, that I've done. I reprioritizing, uh, what's important in my life, fun and family, uh, with this wonderful work that I get to do. Four doctors, Dr. Happiness, Dr. Diet, Dr. Quiet, and Dr. Movement. You ignore one of them, you pay the piper. One hundred percent. Yes, thank you. May, the world is facing some very serious challenges with corporations, organizations like the World Economic Forum and people like Bill Gates trying to literally own, control, and regulate the entire food industry. What are your concerns in this regard? And is Organifi doing anything to try to prevent such pirates from removing our rights to how we farm, feed ourselves, and keep ourselves healthy? And additionally, what do you feel it is essential for people to be aware of on this regard, in this regard, and, and what can you think people should be doing about it? Yeah. I I'm excited to do more and and the focus in running a healthy business that is an alternative to this direction is, I think, really important and takes most of our focus in terms of connected to organic, wonderful sourcing worldwide and bringing that and making it available and, and accessible for anyone. Um, that's really key. And so doing business is a part of how we take a stand for something else. Um, I think showcasing that uh, healthy can be delicious and that, um, you know, our, our, our actual regular food system is not um, the uh, not regular, but our the direction of our food system is is a problem and a concern. Educating on reconnecting with food and wellness and redefining that is a part of how we're addressing this and how we look at this. I think um, again, I wish we were doing more. And this was an interesting question to consider and and really think think more on um, as we develop content and even as we're like shooting at at Drew's. Um, organic farm and I'll say like his his greenhouse and even just whether it's even through video connecting folks to the food system and building a greater awareness I think the then sovereignty falls in the individual's lap for for voting and for participating in the direction of our food system and it's beyond the um, prioritization for price and access that matters I think like you said earlier which is something that I say all the time we we vote with our dollars. Like if you yeah. buy junk, you're promoting the destruction of the planet and yourself. 
and the political system's completely hijacked. Uh, you know, I, I have a little s slogan I show my students. I write the word government, but I push put a dash between the word govern, govern and mint, and then I use a question mark. So instead of government, it's government question mark. What does it mean to govern? Well, we don't have any government anymore. We have a corporate headquarters full of pirates. And uh, that's, that's a very dangerous situation that we, we aren't going to be able to control because we don't have billions and billions of dollars to buy off uh, lobbyists and, and, and congressmen. So what we've got to do is we've got to starve out these dangerous dragons by just not putting money in their mouths anymore. And, and that's the only way we're going to do it. I think the best thing all of us can do is look carefully at what we're putting money into and say, what is sustainable for the planet? And what is mm -hmm. an investment in nature? Because without nature, we're dead. And I, I, I think just a campaign on being aware of what is worthy of our investment and our children's future and our health and what isn't is probably the bottom up movement, the grassroots movement that's got to happen fast before we're all living in an electronic jail owned by Bill Gates and crew eating soylent green and, and uh, getting oh, used as a pin cushion for experimental studies on how to control the human being with high tech biohacking. Cause that's the future right there. If we don't get our shit together. Yeah. And that's a scary, very, very scary future. And it's interesting. I, I, I think, um, as you said, we're, we're voting with our dollars and, and I have a lot of faith in what that can do. Um, whether it's proving out a different model that's worth investing in, in these, you know, definitely money driven people. Um, but 10 years ago, watching organic be relatively new and, and come into uh, new and I'll say in the way that it's being commercialized new in Costco, you know, in San Diego and, and, Granted, there's unfortunately, as we talked about, a lot of fake organic certifications, but at least the consumers made um, a lot of choices 10 years ago that are definitely growing and, and, and organic becoming more financially possible for more farmers because there's a demand for it. So yes. just like you said, I think to me, that's a hopeful example that I got to experience firsthand. And um, and I hope to experience more of that and be part of that in the same way that we were, again, educating in the, in the small sense that we could, educating how important organic was and then watching it be such a such something that grew in, in San Diego first, but nationally and, and more than that. So I always try to be optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We need yeah. to be optimistic. You know, it's kind of like the Quakers say, pray and move your feet. <laughs> Thank you for that. That second right? part is really key. Yeah. You know, just wishing things were better and hoping someone else will fix it is, is the behavior of a child. Yeah. Um, but we've, we've got to pray a lot, but we got to get out there and, and educate people, awaken people and, and make sure our money is going into the hands of the right people. And at least that way, if we all die, we can say we did our best. <laughs> and that right? feels good, honestly. It does. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I do what I do because I think this is the most important thing I can do with my life. And no matter how I die, I know I did my very best. So I'm going to go hang out with God. Give, give, uh, you know, this is all metaphor because there's yes. no God to hang out with like that. But I can, I can look God right in the eyes and say, I did the best for the rest of you I possibly could. And now I deserve a long rest. <laughs> <laughs> One of those four doctors. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I need a vacation somewhere where I don't have to worry about people killing themselves with food and drugs. And, television and <laughs> social media and fake everything. Um, yeah. What's Organifi working on now that's new and interesting? Oh, I, this is a fun question. And um, recently getting to partner with, with folks that are really moving, moving communities has been very exciting. So we've been, been launching a couple products with partners, which has been just an extension of actually our origins. We used to, we used to, um, before we made our own physical products, part of what we, we, um, not pride ourselves, but we're grateful for our ability to be able to do was introduce our community to amazing products, um, programs, uh, thought leaders, uh, so, so much of, of what we're returning to and what we started doing last year was, uh, just 
more, I guess, deeper relationships, but bigger partnerships, which is like, hey, we believe in this movement. We believe in this mission that this individual is on and we want to partner in a bigger way. So returning to some of those roots is something that um, we're continuing to do this year, started last year. Um, and thinking in different dimensions for how we deliver value with our customers and our community. And so a lot of that has to do with partner relationships. This year, you'll see the first of um, several like uh, online events and offline events. So building mm. into community, which is something I'm so excited about. This is, a, this is where we come from, which is community building. That's like my, my expertise with Drew that we did 10 years ago, um, built a massive community, served that community, and then developed a product for that community. So I'm thrilled to be bringing that back. Um, and, and third is, is bringing content. So, um, being, we're launching like a podcast and just being able to, again, serve in, in more diverse ways in a, in a time when product doesn't, um, product gets you one of the many things that we offer. And so yeah. we, we've always believed there's, there's a lot yet to be, um, educated on, communicated on and made available to folks. And it starts with, um, access, you know, um, um, to education and sovereignty and health and nutrition. So in order for us to serve that mission, it's well, you know, well beyond just physical products, which is a huge part of what we do. But this year you'll see us expanding into some new dimensions, which I'm really um, excited for. I'm excited myself. And thank you for sponsoring my podcast because, you know, you're really uh, helping me help a lot of people. And, you know, I think you already know what I do. You're part of it. So grateful and, for that, Paul. Really, really. Yeah, me too. I mean, look, it takes a lot of work to run a good podcast. I do a lot of research. I spend a lot of time and Thank you. I, I can't do it alone. And, uh, you know, it was, it was great spirit answering my prayers to, to get the sponsors that I have because to find four companies that have sustainable practices or certified organic products that really do care about people and our future and the planet is almost a miracle to have happened. Mm. And uh, I think you guys, uh, you are the second people to come to me on your own and, and offer. So I was really super grateful. And it's, it's, uh, you know, I couldn't do it without you guys. So, so you are, you know, you're, I, I am here telling my listeners proof of Organifi's commitment <laughs> is that they sponsor this podcast. Um, what's Organifi's vision for the future and, and why should we be aware of it? Yeah. The much of what we've been talking about actually is is bridging on this and it's it's um redefining the transformation story. We started in a space that was really telling the stories of weight loss and and outwardly I think that is a um you know a, a really typical uh example of transformation and what I'm so excited for is telling the broader like the 5D story of transformation which may have nothing to do with a physical picture you know, um, difference, right? A transformation in a photo. I guarantee it will show up though. <laughs> Even the energy of a photo, right? shows up, but it is the relationships that have transformed. It's the mindset that has changed. It is the lifestyle that has changed. So, you know, we're, I feel like we're just like a budding little seed, you know, addressing the nutritional, so key foundational piece of health. But where again, if I gets to go is, is really supporting the larger perspective on health. And that starts with reconnecting folks to their bodies, reconnecting with the understanding of what their state of health can be and helping guide them to it. So the vision that we're working towards and, and excited by and motivated by is well beyond this physical product space. And, and again, you're seeing, you're seeing a, a small, small examples of it this year start to bud. Excellent. I'm excited for that. I think that's part of the very drive of educating people that we have to have or people aren't going to change because how do you change if you don't know how to do it? Yeah. And, and it's, it's the, just redefining the story of transformation. You know, if we keep looking to calorie restriction over exercising as the way to transform our health and be healthy, that is an outdated healthy. Yeah. And what I'm so excited to is, is to help people redefine healthy in a broad, beautiful way that is living their best life, you know, um, mm -hmm. extending their vitality and presence and energy and, um, you know, really being able to live their best life, which is well beyond how they look in the mirror. Yes. And if you want my help, you know where to find me because I have a lot we to do. say in those areas. We do. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Paul. Well, here's a, a wild and interesting question for you. If you knew you were going to die tomorrow and you had this last chance to get a message to the world right now, what would your parting message for everybody be? 
enjoy healthy. This has been a, a, um, a guiding principle for me to ensure that, um, that the things I'm doing and kind of answering those two questions, is this working and is this for me? It is the understanding that I'm enjoying healthy and being a demonstration of that for those around me. So it's the simple phrase that helps me ground and um, stay centered on um, what I'm here to do and to support others defining that for themselves. Fantastic. I think that's a great parting message. You see, you're already a mother and you don't even know it. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I'll tell you a little story. Um, a lot of my students, you know, they're, they're camera shy. And so they're, you know, they, you know, now we have to do a lot of work on video. All of us do to get the message yes. out because yeah, obviously everything going on. And so they, they often say to me, Paul, how is it that you're so natural in front of a camera? And I'll say, I'll tell you a trick. Consider everybody in the world that knows less than you do about what you're talking about as though they're your child and you're their mother or their father. I said, you don't get nervous teaching your kid how to tie their shoe or ride their bicycle or hold their fork, do you? And they all say no. I said, well, anybody that knows less than you is your child in that regard. So when you're standing in front of a camera, just share your love with all the children in the world that need your help. And then it's easy. And if you want to make it easier to be on camera, then don't try to memorize a bunch of bullshit that you don't know is true and become a talking head. Tell people what you know works for sure because you eat, sleep, breathe, and shit it, and you're sure it works, and then it's easy. That's a perfect recipe. <laughs> yeah, it is the, it's the truth. Um, can you share any websites, resources, or any specials or anything you might want to offer if there are any today? Yes. Thank you, Paul. And I... I want to offer the recommendation to, if you're open to checking out Organifi, if you're ready to integrate delicious tasting, and I'll say it twice, delicious tasting adaptogens in your life today, to um, check out Green Juice, Harmony, and Gold. If you're a woman, as like a, a, a beautiful bundle, it's a 20% off bundle on our site. You can make your own bundle, building that one, Green Juice, Harmony, and Gold. Beautiful rest, great hormonal balance, and really great stress balancing. As I said, really an incredible um, kit. And then for men, my favorite recommendation is our green, red, and gold, which is our sunrise to sunset kit, a really, really helpful starting place. And Paul, you may have a, a top three product recommendation I'd love to make space for. What do you recommend? Men's well, stuff? you know, I, I actually honestly don't have a specific favorite. I think because there's nothing you guys sell that I don't believe in or use, <laughs> I, I think it's really a matter of looking at the descriptions and saying, based on what I feel I need, if I'm tired, what will help me with that? If I've got a lot of stress in my life, then, you know, you guys give great descriptions of everything. you got testimonials. Um, you know, I personally, I think the green juice is, is a really important nutritional component because so few people get that kind of nutrition in their diet. And even if they think they're eating greens, they're eating commercial crap, most of them. I mean, we already Loaded discussed with chemicals it. and toxins. Yeah. 96% of the food eaten in the world is commercial crap. So I think if you just say, well, I need sleep better, you know, try the Organifi Gold or the Organifi, uh, the chocolate version of it. Which is so yummy. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I personally, I, you know, I appreciate the question, but honestly, I can't, <laughs> direct someone toward a product, I would say there's all those products are good and they all have functions just like tools. So go look at the website and take care of yourself. Said is such a, an incredible, powerful coach. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I just tell you how I do it. <laughs> yeah. Go look at what you need. Um, yeah. But I know with uh, your podcast, you've got a, a code they can use for a special discount too, right? Yeah, it'll be, uh, it's in the show notes and, uh, I, Penny normally handles all that. So when she does the, the clothes and it'll all be in there. Perfect. Uh, I can't remember all those things. Penny's got, Penny can remember every credit card, every bank number, every <laughs> you, vault, Penny. every lock. I mean, Penny's got a mind like I, I, it's very divine and it's perfect compliment to my mind. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm like, that. I'm very oriented on what I do and from the time we got together, she said, I'll handle the business. You do what you do well. And, and that's how it's worked beautifully. <laughs> Just so perfect. <laughs> yeah. Well, May, what a great podcast. And I think it's been fantastic because this is the 
probably the deepest we've gone into Organifi and and what you're about and why you do and and all the work you do to keep it safe and healthy and and it's I don't think anyone listening to this podcast uh, could not want to use Organifi products because you're not going to find many companies in the world that are this committed and you know that's one of the reasons I asked you it must be stressful to to really have to deal with all these regulations and controls and people and you know, bad apples. And, and and so I'm really proud of you. You know, I'm not only proud of you because of what you do, but because we have a lack of women in powerful positions. And I think we're at a time in the world where we need the empathy and the compassion and the agape love of women, mm. because the arrows, ass kicker, knock the wall down, kick ass, take names mentality that men have is destroying the planet. So we, we need more women, you know, both my wives are geniuses and they're very nurturing and very capable of seeing and thing, seeing and relating to things in ways that are constantly teaching me as a man what a woman can see and experience that I can't. So to, 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 you know, you're a testament to how smart Drew Cannoli is, is what I would say. You, know? <laughs> you can send him a thank you. <laughs> no, I will. I'll I, I actually <laughs> will. I might, I might. I might call him or text him right when I get off of this call because I'm really grateful he has you in that position. And I want to thank Organifi and my sponsors from the bottom of my heart. And I think I can say thank Drew and um, for helping me educate people and bring the best information I can to people. And uh, I couldn't do it without you guys. So thanks for everything you guys buy from the sponsors because it helps support the podcast. And that supports me to keep supporting you. And if you're buying stuff from my sponsors, then the worst thing that's going to happen to you is you're going to get healthy. You'll <laughs> sleep better and your sex drive will come back and you'll be more creative and you'll go out and do the move your feet that goes with your prayers. So lots of love to all of you. May, once again, thank you. You're an amazing woman. I'm very grateful to have been able to spend this time with you. And my first mission when I see you is to give you a great big hug. Gosh, thank you, Paul, so much for the time, energy, attention, uh, conversation, uh, blown away with our first first official podcast uh, together. So thank you for the shared time. It was an honor, and I really appreciate it. It won't be the last. I promise you that. <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Thank Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest and sponsor of the podcast, May Stiegler. You can visit the Organifi website at organifi.com forward slash check 20 and get 20% off your order using the promo code check 20. That's C-H-E-K-2-0. Find Organifi on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter at Organifi. You can find Paul on Instagram and TikTok at paul.check on Twitter at Paul Check or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. You can also watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and to learn more about the Czech Academy. You could read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. And finally, if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcasts.